All right, we have comedian Bert Kreischer in the building. <laughs> Welcome to Vlad TV. Long time fan. Thank you so much, Long man. Long time fan. Thank you. Yeah, I saw you were like retweeting some of my stuff. And yeah. We started DMing, and then you know, here we go. And I've been seeing your stuff for a minute now. Oh, thank You're you. Killing it on Netflix right now. I've, I've, I'm having a moment. I yeah. Think. <laughs> right, because your stand up plus the show and, and everything. Yeah, stand up. The cabin really helped. It helped elevate my stand up, my specials too. But the three specials on Netflix and the cabin. <laughs> Congrats, man. Thank you very much. Congrats. Thank you. This is your first time here, so I want to get into your whole story. So you grew up in Tampa, Florida. I did. You're a Florida man. <laughs> that is the moniker. You know, I always stand up for Florida, but then you then you then you say things about your childhood from living in Florida, and people are always like, What? Like growing up I knew two dudes without tongues. That's Florida for you. What? Two dudes without tongues. Tongueless Brett and Ha. Those by the way, there are people in Tampa going, I actually know tongueless Brett. Legit. Like yeah, and and uh, how do they lose their tongues? They didn't never told me. No, <laughs> they couldn't. <laughs> they couldn't Dude, write it down for you. People get struck by lightning all the time in Tampa. Like that is like we can't even have giraffes at our zoo. That's how bad lightning is in Florida. Florida <laughs> is so fucked up, but you don't realize it when you're growing up there, and then when you leave, you do Florida things like like, I mean, I, like I remember when someone said something about drinking and driving. I was like, oh yeah, you guys don't do that here. Like Florida was like. I mean, I remember seeing uncles with, with beers in their laps driving a car, and mm. so yeah, I am from Florida. Oh yeah, whenever we put a head like whenever we put a headline up and it starts with Florida man, you know it's gonna be some shit. Like, oh yeah, Florida man brings brings like baby crocodiles to Seven Eleven to like, scare Dude, the patrons. <laughs> I wrote a script for me and Segura one time called Florida Men, where it was just us, and it was like things that I knew that happened in Florida. We were smuggling. Uh, uh, parrots from the islands in PVC pipes in a boat in a lightning storm, and I'm, I'm like, oh, that happened. Like that really happens in in my head, and then yeah, well, one day. Right. I'm looking through some of our uh, headlines here. Florida man arrested for stealing bulldozer to run down Joe Biden signs. Yeah, man, you drink too much. Florida man arrested for snatching woman's five dollar bill and eating it. <laughs> I can see why you do that at Burger King. <laughs> Florida man arrested for hitting deputy in the face with a Bible. I makes all this makes total sense when you grow up in Florida. You're like, no, I know where you were. Florida man arrested for impersonating a cop after pulling over off-duty officer. Okay, hold on one second. Now we did that when we were younger. And by the way, have you ever heard DMX talk about that? That's my favorite interview ever. DMX goes, they go, you pulled someone over. He goes, he wasn't expecting my respecting my authority. And they're like, you have no authority. He goes, dude, let the guy up, beep beep, and then pull over. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, we definitely, I've definitely, we when we were younger, we pulled some people over. Okay, so you're growing up in Florida, and you actually go to a, a private Jesuit high school. All boys Catholic high school. All boys Catholic high school. First fist fight I ever saw there. First time I ever saw a dude's dick, like yeah. a dude's dick, like a like a dude's dick. I remember, you know, I you know, I don't know. Most guys don't grow up like being naked around other guys, especially I had two sisters, and yeah. And I remember going to Jesuit, and they were like FPE getting the showers, and I was like, and there were men like there. I'm 15, 14. And there are like 18 year old men in there, just big dicks, hairy, just everything. And I was like, I'm not ready for that. Like I'm, and yeah, that was the first time. And then I think that made me more comfortable. That experience made me more comfortable about being a man. It really taught me, I'll tell you right now, it taught me how to do stand up because you get to that lunch table, it's all dudes. There's no women there. There's no girls to flirt with. There's none of that. There's just alpha energy. And if you couldn't tell a story about your weekend, that Monday at lunch, you didn't sit at that table. I'd work on my story walking from religion class. I'd be like, and they came and was like, oh, hit the dude. Came from Miami all the way up to Maine. No, Miami all the Like, and you'd work your story out in your head. And, uh, yeah. And, and it was a lot of Cuban dudes. And Cuban dudes are the best storytellers a lot. Okay. <laughs> all right. So then you go to Florida State University. Yeah. It's funny. My, my daughter's applying to colleges. And they're like, we're going to apply to a 15 colleges. Maybe 20. And I was like... I applied to two, Florida and Florida State. <laughs> didn't get in at Florida, went to Florida State. <laughs> Those are my backups. I didn't have any backups. Okay, so when, like, when you were in high school, well, you were going to an all-boys school, so was there like a bunch of partying or would you get into trouble or whatever else or not really? You know, I never, I, oddly enough, I wasn't a big drinker. Uh, I wasn't a huge drinker. I was really focused on sports. Uh, smoked pot a couple times, had panic attacks both times. Or like two, two, two of the handful of times I smoked, so that kind of shut off weed for me. And then, um, but it was like just I got into 
dirt, but like fu- like lighthearted dirt, you know, nothing really bad. I really focused on baseball, to be dead honest with you, okay. and uh, and not yeah, just regular stuff, like regular Porky's type stuff. Okay, but then you get to college, you joined uh, Alpha Tau Omega fraternity. Yep. And then that's when like the party animal came out. No, no. That is when I found out I had a sense of humor. Okay. okay. So like at, when I joined that fraternity. They would have chapters on Sundays, and I realized I was funny around a group of men. Like, I could be stand out funny, and people would tell me, they're like, you should be a comedian. Um, I still didn't party. I didn't party my first, until I was 21. I didn't, like, I partied a little bit. Like, I don't, like, don't want to, like, underscore it. Like, I'd have beers at, every now and then. Didn't get hammered all the time. Wasn't that guy. Didn't, didn't really smoke pot barely at all um, because of the panic attacks when I was younger. D- tried ecstasy, tried coke, tried some stuff. Partied enough, probably more than the average person. In Florida, it didn't, it didn't count as partying. <laughs> but it wasn't until I went to Russia that I started partying. Okay, well, because FSU was ranked as the number one party school yeah. in the United States. Yep. And Rolling Stone did an article on the school, and you were pretty much the, the cover boy for this article. Then I was partying. <laughs> That's when you were partying. <laughs> when I got back from Russia, I... I was like this, I don't know, I, I, something flipped on me, and I legit, well not, not only did I party, but I was a big, loud, boisterous dude. So I was like, the loudest guy at the party, the guy with his shirt off, the guy doing the crazy thing, and I, wouldn't even, I didn't even know that I did that, to be dead honest with you. And, but that, when I got back from Russia, that's when I started partying. I moved out of my fraternity house, moved in with a, a bunch of dudes in this big, we used to call it the ranch, and it was in Indian Village, and it was this huge, like, big Saturday parties. Bong hits before the football games. I mean, just the the greatest time of my life, without mm. a doubt. Okay. Well, I guess you were big into public nudity around that time. Yeah. So you just walk around naked. Yeah, I mean, it happened. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just the weird thing. Is I, I guess people go, like, now you look back and you're like, I guess I shouldn't have gotten naked at parties or whatever, or slid on a slip and slide. But yeah, I, I'm, yeah, sure. Because I remember... Probably around the time that you were doing this, I was going to UC Berkeley, and there was a guy around our school who was known as the naked guy. <laughs> he was like the Spanish dude that basically would walk around with a backpack on campus and just nothing else. Oh, and I, he would try to go to class like this. I did not have that confidence. Right. I did not. I was not. I was. I was like naked at a party, jump off the roof into a pool guy. Okay. I was naked. At a at a like a, at an event where there was a slip side, I na- I actually told my daughters I have a scar on the crack of my ass because I, I was at a fraternity function and I was supposed to clear out all the glass from the grass and I didn't and they're like we'll test the slide out and I was like all right and I did it and ripped my ass open and just bleeding out of my ass. You ripped your ass open. Yeah, I'll show you the scar if you want to see it. No, that's okay. I'll, yeah. I'll take your word for it. So then, at some point in college, you decided to take a Russian class. Signed up for a Russian class. Thought it was Spanish. And uh, three classes later, I was like, oh, this is Russian. This is not what I signed up for. Mm-hmm. And the teacher was hot. And she was like, hey, man, if you stay, I'll just give you a C. And so I took Russian one, two, three, and four and got Cs all the way through. I was just telling someone the, like, elongated version of this story. But, it, yeah, it was, it, I took, I ended up taking a Russian literature class. Mm-hmm. Like, because you could just Cs in it. And then the end of Russian four, they're like, hey, you want to go to Russia? And my dad was the one. He was like, buddy, this will change your life. He had gone to Italy when he was in high school. Mm-hmm. He was like, best trip of my life. You got to go. So my dad told me to go. Met with the head of the Russian department. And the guy was sat down in the, in the foreign languages lab, smoking a cigarette, said something to me in Russian. And I go, I don't know what you're saying. And he looked at the teacher and he's like, he really doesn't know how to speak Russian at all. She's like, not at all. He was like, listen, I'm going to be very direct with you. You're really close to getting a major in Russian. Like, you've taken a lot of classes. <laughs> After going to Russia, if you go, you will be really close. So you got to promise me, if we go, we'll give you C's. You don't have to worry about taking the test. But you'll never take another Russian class. I was like, done. So we went to Russia. Because <laughs> they didn't want you to major in Russia. I, I was like, I was like, <laughs> I was like close to a major in Old Church Slavonic by this time. So yeah, that, and so I, I went to Russia. Took classes over there. Okay, and you had a little quote about Russia uh, during that time. You said, I grew up in the beauty of the Cold War when we knew who our enemies were. And it wasn't racist to hate them. So I knew very little about the Soviet Union growing up. Uh, the Russians were cold, unpleasant people who rarely smiled, mostly because their clothes were gray and uncomfortable. Their women had moles, and their men had drinking problems. That's I wrote that <clears throat> in my book. I, I was really pretty when you say it. Okay, <laughs> as a Russian. 
<laughs> and you know, I, I grew up in Cold War Russia in America as a kid named Vlad. Yeah. In, in an area where there were no other Russians. So it, it was hell during that time. A lot of fist fights, oh. a, lot of, a lot of conflict. Uh, if my name was like Vincent, my, my, my life could have been very different, but <laughs> instead it's Vlad. Vlad's, Vlad. A, Vlad's, a, Vlad's a, Igor is probably worse than Vlad, because mm. Igor was the name that you know, that was like the villain's name in every movie we had growing up. Right. In. Igor, fetch me a brain. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you go to Russia during the Cold War times, and I guess there was a big uh, Russian mob influence at the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, that actually affected your trip. Yeah, we, I found out, I've been getting into this story a lot lately. We're doing a movie uh, based on this story. Really? Yeah, we're doing, it's in development over at, uh, at Legendary. And, and so I'm okay. writing, I'm working with the writers to talk about the story. And, and so they're like, they're asking me questions like this. And I'm, I've been going deeper than I do the story. The story is meant for stage. It's mm -hmm. meant to move smoothly, have a beginning, beginning, middle, and end, a few tags in it, a bunch of jokes. And, uh, but, but yeah, we went, we went in 90, I think 95. And so this is after the wall had fell, mm -hmm. fallen. And after uh, communism fell. After communism fell. Yeah. And, um, and on the flight over, my teacher that I'd taken all the classes with sat next to me in the plane, undid her pants, and she had a wad of cash and a fanny pack. And she explained to me, we're paying off the mafia to keep us safe. And I was like, I was like, I was like, this is gonna be the greatest trip ever. I'm like, immediately, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna have a freaking blast. And so, yeah, so we paid off the mafia to keep us safe. And okay. they lived with us, they walked us to class, walked us back from class, and their room was right next door to mine, literally right next door to mine. And so the first night, no Russian, went out, walked the streets of Moscow or St. Petersburg, got vodka, Baltica, which is their beer, a lemon and some sugar. So we were gonna do lemon drops, right? That's exactly all the only way that I drank vodka. Knocked on their door and I was like, uh, uh, by the way, my Russian's horrible. I know you're gonna, uh, my name is Bert. Very pleasant to meet you. Something about a cat. I work pussy. You work <laughs> pussy. Okay. Didn't translate out right, but, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And by the way, this is the one part that no one ever understands of this story is it doesn't matter because the second the door opens, I'm face to face with a, a, like a, a dude who's not smiling, who just literally members only jacket. I remember he had a members only jacket members on. Only I, jacket. Say, I say tattoos, wife beater, track pants, because that's the story. But in real life, just had a members only jacket on. He just stared at me and goes, Sto. What I was trying to say, and you'll understand this, is I'm the man. Yamashina? And I said, mm -hmm. Yamashinu, which means I'm a car. And he started laughing hysterically and just goes, come on in, Paidium. And he brought me in and he said to his friends, he goes, say it again. And I didn't know what I'd said, but I knew that it got me this far. So I said, I'm the machine. And they started laughing and that's all I knew how to say. He spoke English, a little bit of English, enough, a lot of English. And they didn't, and the whole night. And then, and then, and then I pulled out the lemon and the sugar to do a lemon drop of vodkas. And one of the guys goes, oh, the machine runs on lemons. And the place <laughs> fell out laughing. Okay. And then I became friends with them. Okay. And then at one point, there was a train ride that kind of took a twist. Yeah. The, um, so we, go to, we take an overnight train. And I hung out with this dude, Igor. I hung out with him the entire trip. He was like my buddy. Like, we did a lot of stuff together. And uh, one night, class take an overnight train trip. And I tell Igor, I said, it's... Uh, I, uh, I can't wait. This is going to be a blast. We got to get the same cabin. And he goes, oh, I'm not going. So why not? He goes, different mafia runs train, different mafia runs Moscow. And I was like, he's like, don't worry. I had to set up the Benditi. They'll take care of you. Bendit. I don't know. You know how to say it better than I do. But, yeah. And so brings me over, introduces me to the two new gangsters at the train, Igor and Igor. And he's like, this is the machine. If you give them vodka, you're going to have a great time. <laughs> and they were like, brought me into first class. They took me into their cabin. There's food. There's a whole spread, booze. Everyone that works on the trains coming in, like saying, taking a shot with me. Oh, the conductor. Swear to God. I used to say this. I used to say this on stage. Swear to God on my children's life. The conductor. Swear to God on my children's life. Ripped off the stars and stripes to his shirt, little on his sleeve. Ripped him off. Gave him to me and goes, "This is a present for the machine." I swear to you. I have that at my parents' house. I swear to you. And I was like. Oh, now in real life, there was another guy with me, John Bolshoi. If you read my book, you'll hear. There was another guy, John Ball, Big John. Big John, yeah. And he was like, 
He was like, dude, these machine stories might have gotten out of control. And I was like, you think? So we partied all night, partied, and then ended up robbing the train. So you robbed the whole train? We robbed our, my class. Well, we robbed the bar cart first. Then we robbed my class. Then they robbed the majority of the train with John and my help a little bit. Meaning, like, robbed how? So what they do is they would open the door. So they're all, they're all like sleeper cabins, the more my class mm-hmm. was in. Slide the door open a little bit. Little Igor would crawl in and start sliding bags into the hallway. And then Big Igor would kind of stand watch, and then he would go through the bags, John and I would go through the bags, take out whatever we felt. It was kind of weird robbing your friends because we were like, we didn't want to take anything good, but you didn't want to let down the, so we, then we'd slide the bag back in, come out, next cabin. Did that all the way down, and then, uh, yeah, so you rob a train. Nobody woke up. Uh, no, someone did. Someone did. By the way, I'm, 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 I'm straddling the truth and the story I tell on stage because there's a, it's a true story. That's why it went viral, mm-hmm. is that it's a true story. It happened. And, um, yeah, someone woke up and they spit vodka in her eyes. And then we went back to our first class cabin. And, uh, and yeah. Okay. And the police showed up afterwards. So we, let, we get to Moscow and one of the teachers uh, said they told the police. And the police were standing, talking to my whole class. I remember this so vividly. I can tell you, I can, I mean, I just remember this so vividly. And I was hammered. I was the drunk, one of the top five drunkest I've ever been in my entire life. Cops were talking to my class. I remember this guy, DJ, was in flannel pajamas. Shout out to DJ. He was a kid in my class. We robbed him. And uh, <laughs> they were talking to the cops, and Big Igor was like, oh, I, I speak to police for both of us. Don't worry. I, I speak. Don't worry. His, his English was horrible. Walks out to the cop, spins him around, and just gets in his face, starts. Telling him his business. I don't know what he's saying, but he's just going off, pointing to me, pointing to John, and pointing, and then he goes, points to me again, and the cop just looks at me and says, I don't even know. That's what I say in the joke. Get the fuck over here. So I walk over, and I get up to the cop, and he grabs me, and he looks at me, and he goes, So I understand you're the machine. So I am. He goes, Tonight you party with us. And I was like, You being serious? And he goes, Yeah. Tonight you party with us, yes? Do you like strip club? I was like, I fucking love strip clubs. I'm from Florida. Are you kidding me? So, yeah, we went out. You partied with the cops this time. We ended up partying with the cops, yeah. And the mafia guys? Or and the mafia. No, no, no. Was, well, interestingly <laughs> enough, I had to party with those mafia guys on the ride back to St. Petersburg. Okay. So they said to us as when we're coming back, oh, I think we're in trouble, right? I think I'm getting sent home. And uh, my teacher comes into our room. Me and John shared a room. And she goes, uh, we talked to everyone back in St. Petersburg. And they said, you know, nothing really bad happened. So... If you guys could just party with them again, you kind of kept them at bay. They had a good time with you. <laughs> and now I'm terrified. I'm like, I'm like, ter- I'm like, in real life, I'm terrified. I mean, there's the legend of the story of the thing, but I'm telling you, I get to be very honest. Oh, I was yeah. terrified. I was terrified. Oh yeah, You're getting locked up in Russia, you know, in the gulag, in the gulag, locked up abroad. Bro, that's just like everything I heard. <laughs> Such a Siberia, maybe. <laughs> Having to get a tattoo of a man's name on my cock, like. <laughs> The fucking, with tire? That's how they do tire? Dude, I know a lot about the Russian Mafia now. That's how they do the tattoos with the t- with with melted tires. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I knew, yeah. I, But, and so, yeah, we partied, and then, and then when we got back, this is a fascinating part. When we got back, we had a class meeting, you know, like, hey, you can't rob each other. You know, big class meeting. <laughs> and, uh, can't rob and I remember each someone other. had some, some people had some opinions, like, like, this is bullshit. He should be in trouble. And Igor, my guy, just stood up and he was like, is everyone alive? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, no one's dead. And they're like, yeah. And he goes, then you should thank the machine. Because he, look, they, they, we're, you're in Russia. You're not in fucking America. This is a different fucking world. <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, bye, And Dion. I just got Let's up go. and I was like, see you guys. I promise I won't rob you again. <laughs> okay. So you get back to, to the States. You, you go back to college. And you were there for six years? Six and a half years. Yeah. Six and a half years. So this is, I mean, like, this is what I love about your, this is what I love about your show. Yes, I come back, my girlfriend cheats on me with my best friend, mm. right? I fracture. I think I fracture. I remember, I can tell you, the night I started really partying, my buddy Mike Osborne said, I'm hurting, I don't know what I'm, like, I'm like, I this girl I've been dating all through college cheated on me. And he goes, I can tell you one thing, um, if you drink, those feelings go away. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, really? And he goes, I'm not saying this is great advice, but I will drink with you until those feelings go away. And we went to my buddy Clint Munn's house, and we got wasted, and I felt better. And I woke up, felt crappy, to play a little Frisbee golf, smoke some weed, started drinking. And I was like, yeah, so I think my initial going into partying was really running away from my hurt from this relationship. And then 
And also I had realized in when I backpacked through Europe, I had realized backpacking through Europe that I was really funny and I could be funny and entertaining around a campfire or in a bar to people that didn't even speak my language. I could make people laugh. And I really think that's when I was like, I, I got to somehow get into comedy or something to that effect. And partying kind of greased those wheels. For That was when I was the funniest, is when we were all smoking weed and, pat, and I was playing the guitar and making up songs. Or, and, and I really turned dialed into partying after that. Okay. And then at one point, uh, you started doing stand-up, I guess, in uh, Tallahassee? I did one night of stand-up. In uh, at Potbelly's in Tallahassee, I did 30 minutes after four accomplished comedians. I'd been written up in Rolling Stone magazine, and I'd said in the article, "I want to be a stand-up." And so this radio station put on a night of stand-up, put up four comics, and then me. I think they were doing it to watch me fail, like to like set me up for failure to talk about it on the show the next morning. Mm -hmm. And I I legit had a amazing set. And then they offered me my own morning show. They came out and they were like. You'd like to play third mic to this guy. You'll be on the show. You know, it's a job. It's not a ton of money. but And then he's going to leave. And it'll be your show. And I was like, for real? In my head, I'm like, this is what this is the plan I was looking for. Sat with the dude outside Pop Ellie's. And I said, so uh, this is going to be great. And he's like, yeah, it'll be fun. I'll teach everything. And then you'll take over. And I was like, where are you going? And he was like, New York. I said, why? And he goes, who the fuck wants to live in Tallahassee? <laughs> <laughs> and I literally went, not me. I'm moving to New York too. In my head, I thought, if I did one thing of stand-up and I got this guy's job already, I'm going to fucking get in front of him. I don't know who this guy is. I wish I knew who he was. I'd love well, to see what happened to his career. Wait, you got offered a morning show gig at a radio station after doing stand-up one night? I was also famous. Not, not famous that we know now, but at the time, this is before reality television, this is when a magazine article yeah. was like a big deal. And yeah. I, and like And so like, I was definitely famous in Tallahassee, mm -hmm. and um, and so yeah, they offered me my own morning show. Okay, which you didn't take. I didn't take. Moved to New York. So you moved to New York. I guess around twenty six years old. Twenty five. Twenty five. Okay, so now you're in the big time. Yeah, and uh, I guess you get a a job at the Boston Comedy Club. Get a job working at the Boston Comedy Club on my twenty sixth birthday. Right, and you're uh, <clears throat> and you're barking. <laughs> Explain to everyone what barking is. Barking is a handful of flyers standing on the street on West 3rd working between Thompson and Sullivan. Mm -hmm. I didn't leave Thompson and Sullivan. And anyone that walked by, I go, hey, we got a great comedy show tonight. Great lineup. Uh, Dave Chappelle is going to be by here. Talent. Based on, it, it, was really, it was really like profiling a person. So if it was young college kids, Dave Attell, or Dave Chappelle, Dave Attell, Jim Brewer, Jim Gaffigan, that's who you'd pitch. And then if it was like, Puerto Rican guys, you'd be like Talent, uh, Will Savance, like uh, Tracy Morgan. You'd pitch whatever you thought they like, and and if you could bring people in, I you cover was like I want to say like five bucks, mm -hmm. but I'd let people in for free all the time. Okay, are you just making up the names of the comedians that are supposed to be there? Or? Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> so they Dave were Chappelle, never there. They were never there. Dave, Dave Chappelle, Chappelle wasn't Chappelle. actually there. I saw him perform at that club two times, <laughs> <laughs> and I worked there for a year. Okay. Yeah. i been, but you would just because you never knew who would drop in. And you knew the lineup, but I couldn't sell it with like, hey guys, Bobby Kelly, Pete Corielli, Jim Norton, like these are the guys that were working. Mm -hmm. DC Benny, uh, the uh, Godfrey, like you couldn't pitch it that way. So you'd always pitch the higher guys, and then sometimes they'd show up. <laughs> I remember I pitched George Carlin. <laughs> George Carlin was walking down the street, and I was okay. like, hey, we got a great comedy show. You like comedy? And he laughed to you, and I do. He said, who's on the lineup? And I said, a uh, lot of big names. I don't know, man. Like, who are you into? <laughs> he was just like, ah. I go, what kind of comedy do you like? And he goes, I like, uh, like I said, well, we, and, I, it was, and then I ended up just hanging out and talking to him. Karen Burgreen is the one I pitched him. Mm. Karen Burgreen. Okay. At one point, you meet Tracy Morgan. Yep. Uh, tell me the story. Uh, I got I to gotta start telling the story by saying that Tracy Morgan t says this has never happened. Now, I got to say that because I respect Tracy and I don't want to put him in a situation that he, if he wants, whatever he wants to say is his truth, is his truth. I was there, and other dudes were there. Okay, just <laughs> okay. for the record. For the record. For the record, I, and I'm just, I'm just telling this. I never wanted this story to get out, but it's a good, it's a great fucking story. Okay. So Tracy Morgan uh, is walking down the street. Tony, I'm with a guy named Tony Woods. Tony's like, "Yo, man, Tracy Morgan's coming out partying tonight." I was like, "Oh." Now, by the way, this is like 22 years ago. This is, Tracy was on Saturday Night Live, but he wasn't like who he is today. Yeah, he was just starting. He was just, well, he was just well, starting, just starting on, on Saturday yeah. on SNL. Yeah. And he's like, we're going out. 
And so he introduced me to Tracy. He's like, Tracy, there's Sugar Bear, Sugar Bear, there's Tracy. And then I watched Tracy do stand up, and it was just fucking amazing. I mean, it's, it's amazing to watch that guy work. Comes out, and he's like, yo, man, you wanna get high? And I was like, yeah. So we take a left out of uh, Boston Comedy Club down to, I think, Thompson or Sullivan, whichever one was down the left. There was a peanut butter and jelly uh, store that had just opened. I don't, I don't know why I remember that. Uh, and he likes a joint, hands me the joint. I hit the joint. Well, and before you, you go further, this was not a regular, you know, these pre-rolled, nice-looking oh, this joints. Was, this joint looked like it had lived a life. Like, it, <laughs> if this joint could tell its story, it would be like, I was rolled at a Molly Hatchet concert <laughs> and then traded for an awkward hand job in the back of a Camaro. Like, it was a mess of a joint. And, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not judging. I'm just saying it's a fuck. It looks doesn't look like... Right. It's been in his pocket for a week. Right. It said it looked like, looked like a croissant. <laughs> yeah. It was a fucking mess. And he lights it, hands it to me, and I hit it, and it just t- it tastes like shit. And I go, what's wrong with your weed? He looks offended, and he's like, what? I said, your weed tastes like shit. I was like, what's wrong with your weed? And he was like, oh, shit. You never smoked Sherm before? I was like, what? And he goes, Sherm, baby, angel dust. You never smoked Sherm before? And I panic. I panic immediately. I walk away from him. I go over to Tony Woods, and I go, I just smoked PCP with Tracy Morgan. And he's like, no, you didn't. I go, no, I did. And he goes, no, you didn't. I said, no, I did. And he goes, no, you didn't. Trust me. I know that man. He does not smoke PCP. And I go, for real? And he goes, maybe. <laughs> he's like, he goes, listen, I think he's fucking with you because you're white. Like, I think you said something. And then, and for the record, I will say this. I don't think I smoke PCP with Tracy Morgan. I don't think P- Tracy Morgan smokes PCP. But he is known to fuck with younger comics aggressively his whole entire career. And so he goes, so now I'm freaking out, right? Tony goes, don't go home. I said, what? And he goes, don't go home. If you go home, you're going to believe you're on PCP. You're going to jump out of a fucking window. I know you. Mm. He goes, come out with us. We're going out. So we go out to a club called Madame X on Houston Street. Tiny little down the stairs. All the way in the back, Tracy Morgan is holding court. There are 20 black dudes with him. Everyone's there. Tracy's got champagne bottles in each hand. Anytime a girl walks by, he yells something outrageous. Now, mind you, I'm six months out of Tallahassee. I've never seen anything like this. Girl walks by. I need a bitch with a C-section skull. Place goes fucking nuts, right? He is on SNL. He's got, and he's being what you want a celebrity to be, right? Big, loud. I got a pretty dick. You can suck it with the lights on. Like, I mean... I, am, I want to be a part of this night, but I don't want to be a part of this bill because everyone's got champagne bottles. I don't want to be... So I go over to the bar, get a Heineken, and post up and have one of the best nights of my life. Six months out of Tallahassee, and I'm sitting here with a guy from SNL, partying balls, laughing hysterically. One of the funniest nights I've ever had. And at the end of the night, we're all sitting around, and it's like 3.30. Little white waitress comes up with a bill, looks around at 22 black dudes and me, and just places it in front of me. And the fucking place just goes like, oh! Like the biggest faux pas. And she, and, and she goes, what? And, and Tracy goes, what? why'd you give him the bill? She was like, well, I just, I just figured, I, well, I just assumed. He's like, what, that he's our coach? And she's like, what? He goes, oh, that he's our lawyer? Like, we're black, we can't have money? And she goes, no, sir. And he goes, no, fuck, sir. You just, I'm, I'm the rich motherfucker in here. And she goes, oh, moves the bill to him. He goes, oh, now I got money. Because you're racist and you, I spoke up. And it is, and it's a commotion. And then the girl, it, it escalates and the girl says something. And he rips his shirt off and throws it in her face. He goes, fuck you, bitch. And then these bouncers, two ex-NFL guards, post up on each of his shoulders like, hey, my man. And Tracy Morgan just looks around and goes, bitch, I ain't your man. And boom, the biggest fight I've ever been in my life breaks out. I think I'm on PCP. I walk out the door and I'm like panicking. I'm like, this isn't what the night I thought I was going to have. I just, I like, I'm walking back. I think I left my backpack in there. Like I'm freaking out. Tony comes out and Tony's like, shit's going off, dude. Tracy's got like nine dudes on him. All of a sudden, doors are kicked open. And a limp, shirtless Tracy Morgan is thrown up a flight of stairs. And lands on the. Oh, we're on Houston Street. It is three thirty-five in the morning. All I'm thinking is, what are we gonna do with the dead Tracy Morgan? Doors kick open and his shirt comes out. Right, <laughs> lands on his back. I look at Tony. Tony looks at me, and out of the corner of my eye, Tracy Morgan just stands up, snaps his shirt, and goes, "Now that's how you get out of paying a check," and just walks away. I go, "What the fuck? What the fuck?" I'm like, "Are you shitting me?" That is the. I'm like, and I'm sitting there like this. 
this and Tony goes, you coming? I go, no, I'm not coming. No, I'm going home. I'm going to go to bed. I'm not on PCP. I'm sleeping tonight. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, uh, I, it bums me out that he, uh, that that story bothers him, you know, because I, I really respect Trey. I think Trey's a great, but that's a true story. That's probably the PCP part. Well, yeah. Well, if you probably take that part out, he'll probably admit to it. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> I think, I think that I've commented on his weed. He told me whatever he wanted to tell me, and I believed it. He was probably fucking with me. I don't think I was on PCP, but uh, but it's still a great fucking story. Well, you said, I guess in your book, if you've never gotten high with a black man, you're not living the way God intended. That's uh, funny. The I, list of black comics I've gotten high with looks like the set list for a Def Jam reunion show. Bro, I've, I've done coke with a lot of black comics. Can you say who? No. Are you fucking <laughs> kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you no, I couldn't. I had to ask. I got yeah. No, I don't blame you. Well, but, uh, I mean, but a lot of a lot of comics have admitted to doing coke. A lot, man. The one thing I've learned, the one thing I've learned is that don't drop dirt on the people you do dirt with. Mm. Like, I, and I I think that's where I fucked up on the Tracy Morgan story. Is I I told a story that should have been left in the back of comedy clubs, and and I told it got it got out. I wasn't the one that told it for it to get out, but it got out. And, uh, and I should have just, I should have respected the dude and been like, and been like, just keep it between us. You know, like, be, let it be a story that the comics tell each other. Well, I got to say, I've, I've been in the same room with Tracy when he was being interviewed by uh, Ed Lover and might be the funniest person I've ever been around. Dude. Like, off camera, no, you know, no video footage rolling, just straight funny 24-7. I might have to say is Tracy Morgan. Oh, dude, I, I'll tell you right now, I, Tracy Morgan has made, I probably have more of an impact on my career, the way he would come in and do morning radio or morning television and be just a live wire. Like, be someone that was so unpredictable and so hilarious and so off book. And I mean, I, I, the guy is an absolute genius, and I, I respect him so much. And I'll tell you, man, the one thing that bums me out is I'm, I don't think we'll ever be friends because I don't think he likes me. But yeah. whatever. I mean, everyone's got his. Everyone's got their own stories and and whatever. <laughs> I can still like him. I'm still a fan of his. Yeah, he'll get over it. Yeah. Uh, or not. <laughs> or not. Or one day I'll get smacked in front of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so you're working at this uh, this Boston Comedy Club, mm -hmm. and then I guess the owner sets up a, a showcase for you and Will Smith's company. Yep. Uh, so I was, at the time, at the time I was working the door and I was just letting anyone that went to NYU come in. And so everyone's unraised drinking. And so I have this like huge following of college kids that basically can drink for, for cheap and don't get ID'd. And I go up at the end of the night and they love me. And so Time Out New York writes an article about me because of this. And then Will Smith's people, David Tochterman specifically, uh, saw the article and Barry Katz called me up and he's like, they want to see you do stand up. And so I went. And I did uh, like seven minutes, and I just had a dream set. I had one of those dream sets that you get. One, probably, you probably get ten of them out of your life, and uh, the next day they were offered me a development deal. I, I take that back. They said they offered me a development deal, and they said it's contingent upon meeting Will and Will liking you. Okay, so you met Will. Met Will at I want I want to say the Hit Factory. I was I want to remember the thing. Say that's the name on the Upper West Side. Mm -hmm. He was in. He was doing Willennium, and uh, I would go in. I remember I brought a camera. My manager was like, "Don't bring a camera. Don't bring a camera. If you want to be, you want to be his peer. You don't ask to take a picture with him." And I was like, mm -hmm. "Okay." So I, I have no pictures of me and Will ever. Go in. They sit. Uh, they sit two chairs in the middle of a dance studio, uh, facing two folding chairs in the middle of a dance studio, facing each other, and they're like, "We'll be in in a second. I sat with the chair with my back to the door. I didn't know what door he was coming in. And he walked in behind me, and I could feel his energy. I mean, <laughs> sincerely, like, you know when you say, like, oh, that guy's got it, the it factor? Mm -hmm. He's got it, and he's mm -hmm. got it all over him. He walks in, gives me a hug. I mean, all I remember him saying is one love. At the time, I don't know if he still says it, but he's saying that to everyone. One love, one love. Gives me a hug, says one love, and I was off to the fucking races. I was like... I need this guy to like me, and I love this dude, and I love hip hop, and I am a big hip hop guy. So I was, I just, I just went, and then I was like, and even if he doesn't like me, I'm gonna find out all the questions of the shit I really want to know. 
Mm. So I like went through, I asked him what he thought about, at the time, Cash Money was blowing up. I asked him what he thought about uh, Juvenile, what he thought about uh, Wayne. Like I, I went through, I went through everything. I want to know what he thought about Outkast. I want to know what he thought about, because I just come uh, upon the fact that like, Hip hop was made for the place that you listen to it. So New York, it's all headsets. Miami, it's all bass. Like, like, and I was like, I was, I was off to the races. And he liked me. He liked me. He was like, let's go see a movie. I was like, okay. <laughs> you guys went to a movie. I called my dad, and I was like, I got in the car. My dad goes, how'd it go? I go, it went great. He was like, uh, really? And I said, yeah, we're going to the movies. <laughs> my dad's like, what? I go, we're going to the movies. And he was like, want a date? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, I really didn't ask. Like, I was just needed, and he was like, what do you mean, like, what, you and him are going to the movies together? I was like, yeah, I guess. And I was like, it's at Planet Hollywood. And he was like, they have a movie theater there? I was like, I, Dad, I don't know. Maybe we'll go get lunch there and dinner, and then we'll go to the movies? And he was like, oh, buddy. He's trying to fuck you. <laughs> and I was like, I go, what? And he goes, listen, this is very popular in Hollywood. These guys have had so much pussy, they get tired of it. And so they're trying to turn out young boys. That's the only thing that really excites them is watching the look in your eyes when you, when you have to suck your first dick. And I was like, are you being serious? He goes, no, I mean, I've heard about it. I'm not, I'm not sure that's what this is. I just want to warn you. Look, you're my only son. I don't want you to go in there unprepared and end up sucking this guy's dick. I'm just saying. And I was like, okay. So I go, what do I do? And he goes, show up. He goes, show up. And he was like, I could be wrong. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just letting you know. You don't want to go in not knowing something. So I, was, I, I showed up. <laughs> I showed up and uh, I went to Planet Hollywood up by uh, like 56th up in that area mm-hmm. near Columbus Circle. And I walked in and I walked in the front lane and I was like, I'm here to, is Will Smith here? She was like, yeah, in the back. And I was like, oh, oh. so funny. I didn't think he'd be like eating dinner with everyone. I start walking through. She sent me like a mannequin of Will Smith. I go, no, no, no. <laughs> the actual Will Smith. And the look on her face was like, was like I said, I break off dolphins' beaks. She was like, huh? I said, I'm here for Will Smith, the person. She was like, hey man, celebrities don't hang out at Planet Hollywood. <laughs> and I was like, am I getting punk? At least in my head, I'm like, at least I'm not fucking anybody, right? <laughs> so I go, is it cool if I wait? And she was like, yeah, you can wait all you want. And so I sat in the lobby of Planet Hollywood, like in a little waiting room for like 10 minutes maybe. And then all of a sudden this door behind me opens up and this six foot five, 350 pound black dude named Charlie Mack sticks his head out and he's like, you Bert? I was like, yeah. And he goes, downstairs. So I'm like, oh shit. So I follow, I'm thinking, I gotta fuck this guy too. This is gonna be a long fucking night. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So I get downstairs and it's 10 black dudes, all in a, a small room, probably the same size as this, with curtains all around it and a folding table in the center. And I'm looking and I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna fuck these 10 black dudes. Will, Charlie Mack, I know he's bringing Jazzy Jeff, that's 13 black, I'm fucking a lot of dudes tonight. Like in my head, I'm like, if this is if this is a scenario, I am screwed. And I just sit with my back against the curtain and I don't make eye contact and I just kind of like, like no one's talking to me, they're talking to each other and, and I'm just waiting and then Will Smith shows up with Jazzy Jeff. I swear to God, with Jazzy Jeff. With the fucking glass, it's Jazzy Jeff from the fucking Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? Right. Comes in and he's like, hey, this is Bert. And everyone's like, oh, he's like, this is the guy I was telling you about. And they're like, oh, okay. And they all start walking. I'm like, all right, here we go. I'm sucking dicks first. And then and then the curtains behind me open and there's a private movie theater. And Will's like, grab us two seats. Um, what do you want to drink? And I was like, what are you getting? And he's like, Long Island iced tea. And I was like, I'll take one too. He's like, you like shrimp? I was like, I love shrimp. He's like, okay. And he's like, get us a bunch of shrimp and a couple of Long Island iced teas. He's like, have you seen American Pie yet? And I said, no. And he goes, that's what we're watching. And I was like, oh, okay. And in my head, I'm like, That's, this turned really fun. Like, <laughs> So we sat and watched American Pie. And I didn't know, I was uncomfortable because I didn't know if he was judging my sense of humor. Because like, I was wondering if he was like, this is a white guy comedy, like white boy comedy. I want to see what he finds funny, what I find funny. Or I didn't know if that was like a test. Mm-hmm. So I was a little on edge a little bit. And then I get drunk. And he goes, uh, he's like, so what did you think? I was like, it was great. And he was like, no, about, about the guys. I was like, I didn't fuck him? I don't, what, do you want, what do you want from me? And he was like, no. You said you're a hip-hop fan. He's like, this cool Modi, this Biz Marquee. I'm like, holy fucking shit. Like, I could have fucked cool Modi? Like, I'm literally like, oh my God. And then I end up meeting him and then and seeing him. Like, I saw him. He was on my TV show. I got a TV show right after this. And he was on my TV show. And I was like, yo, Mo. And he was like, oh, what's up? I said, we watched a movie together. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then, and then, and then. 
you know, in, in true form, is that was, is where the story I tell you ends. But the truth of the story is, Will's like, what do you want to watch tomorrow? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, all right, we'll do a movie tomorrow night, guys, right? And everyone's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, tomorrow will be the time that I, like, get to know these guys. And then I can be, like, friends with my heroes. And I didn't show up. You didn't show up. I didn't show up. I got nervous. I didn't know if I was really invited. I didn't know if, like, he was saying that to them. And then, like, you know when you overthink something? Mm. And I didn't show up. And then Will kept saying, I remember, we ended up working together for a year. And he was like, and you stood me up. Can you believe you stood me up? No one, who stands up? I mean, you stood me up. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I always want to tell him, like, I'm so sorry. By the way, this is another story, just like the Tracy Morgan story, where I know if Will hears this, he's going to be like, fuck that guy, right? <laughs> I'm not gay. I didn't want to fuck you in the ass. I was trying to be nice. And you turned it into something horrible. But that's the way, I don't know, man. I, whatever. So then the show, Birth the Conqueror. Did that yeah. come from Will Smith's production company? No, no. So Will and I developed a show. It was, uh, I can't remember what, it was based on, it was like, uh, I was the party guy at college and I ran the school. And then, and then that deal went away. I got a deal at CBS. And then during that time, I got a show called The X Show. And I started doing stuff there, uh, like, it was a late night talk show, that's where I saw Cool Mo D, interviewed a bunch of people, and then, and then from that I did a show called Hurt Burt, where I took dangerous men's jobs for a day. Mm -hmm. So I was like a wildlife photographer for Great White Sharks, Out of the Cage, MMA fighter, Dominatrix Gimp, like I fought a bear. I Dominatrix Gimp? Dino, yeah, Dominatrix Gimp. How did that one go? Whew. <laughs> I mean, dude, we shot a porn, like we shot a porn, like I'm not even joking, like I remember, I was at a TV show on FX. And I am harnessed up completely naked. I remember the first thing, I get harnessed up, I'm naked, right? Naked. Lights turn on, blindfolds off, and there's a full camera crew there. And the first thing Mistress Isabella says is, uh, we got a blood cock. And I was like, what? She's like, your dick is, uh, it's like a small dick, but it gets bigger when you get hard. And I was like, no, cool. <laughs> and then she tortured me, put, tortured me for like an hour in front of a film crew and, uh, and yeah, and, and and by the way, I'm naked, and they're fucking putting weights on my balls, and electro shocking my dick, and f doing everything to me, like nipples and wax. And I'm looking at this film crew, my TV film crew, going, "Are, are we shooting a pornography? We're shooting a pornography, right?" Yeah. Uh, okay. And then and then and then uh, said I'd never do that shit again, right? And then Bert the Conqueror comes up, and it's a travel channel. And it's with the production company who's doing Man vs. Food. And I'm a big Man vs. Food fan. So I take the meeting just to talk about Man vs. Food and end up doing the fucking show. <laughs> okay. Well, the whole wrestling with a bear, that, that was on which show? Hurt Burt. Hurt Burt. Yeah. Hurt Burt was the dumbest idea I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> Without a doubt. That is, that is someone hungry for Hollywood. That is Burt Kreischer at his youngest <laughs> with big dreams of just... Of just Let's get greenlit on something and then get into movies or whatever. It's I, I don't think I have any passion for art at that time. I'm just a young kid going, going. If if it'll get views, let's do it. If it'll fucking move the needle, let's do it. So I fought a bear. I tamed lions. Wait, so you actually fought a bear. I fought a bear, yeah. That was the whole. You put the marshmallow, the marshmallow in, your in your mouth, and the bear took the mushroom, the, the marshmallow out of your mouth. Yeah, I, it was up in, up like off the 14. Like in that area mm -hmm. in California, we drive up. I just started dating my wife. She was coming up to meet me up there. She's a big animal person. And so uh, the first thing they do is I fought a bear. Is they, I see the bear and the bear, is, I remember the bear was jumping up in the air. It's like a 10 foot grizzly bear. And it's jumping up in the, like all four feet, leaping up in the air. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, are we gonna sedate this thing? And they're like, no, 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 no. You, you just gotta get, he's very cool. You just gotta get comfortable with him. And I was like, okay. So they bring him out, and uh, and uh, they're like, "This is how you get to meet him." You know, they give me a marshmallow, and they're like, "Put the marshmallow in your mouth," and then like nonchalantly, just kind of show him the marshmallow, like just go like, "Oh," and then he'll see it, and he's gonna take it out of his mouth, out of your mouth with his mouth. That that's how he's gonna learn to trust you. And I was like, "Fuck that!" I go, "I want to trust the bear. Fuck the bear trusting me. What is this? What it, what?" I, they, I go, and they're like, "Guys, this is how it's done." Gives me five marshmallows. So I take the marshmallows. I fucking ghost one into my mouth. And then like a hooker walk in front of the bear like, Aww. and the bear, you can see the bear light up like, oh shit, he's got marshmallows on my favorite things. And he just tongues it out of my mouth aggressively. I am, bears very seldomly, never brush their teeth. Never, not never brush their teeth. I'm making out with a homeless person five times in a row. Just, Hurr! and we get done. And he's like, all right, we're ready. Let's go. And I'm like, 
hold on, I haven't learned anything. The guy goes, you learned the most important lesson. That bear loves marshmallows. <laughs> so if you're in trouble, just say marshmallow, and the bear's going to hear that. He'll go, oh, shit, he's got a marshmallow. But more importantly, we'll hear that, and we'll know to get you out of that. That's your safe word. And I was like, I was like, all right. And so then the, we were by a picnic bench, and uh, the bear was sitting on a picnic bench. I mean, literally sitting on a picnic bench. He's like, let's go. It's almost like the bear was like an act like, all right, let's go. Let's fucking do this. And he gets up, and he grabs me by the head with both paws. I mean, it go, it's crazy. I could only correlate it to a car accident. When you're in a car accident, you realize, oh, I didn't have control of anything. I never had control of my day at all. I didn't know that. I <laughs> thought today was my day. I got my car and I drive to work. But all of a sudden, I get hit. Now, there's no, there's, life is unpredictable. That bear puts his paws on my ears, and it goes silent, and he lifts me off the ground. I remember feeling his claws in the back of my head. And my first thought was, why are his claws still in? Like, why does he need claws? If this is a stunt bear, we, would, we should take out his claws. <laughs> Immediately, just lifts me up and starts ragdolling me like literally just and I'm just going marshmallow marshmallow help marshmallow bears no one's hearing a thing because there's a nine foot grizzly bear just going and everyone's I can hear oh yeah we're getting it we're getting it spins me around by the way it's the small details that count this is how I remember it that claw went into my belt loop and he spun me around I could I literally had no choice and puts me in a bear hug and is now, we're both facing the same direction. He's grinding on my ass, and I'm looking at the trainer going, fucking marshmallow. Dude, take a look at what's happening. Marshmallow, marshmallow. And the trainer's not laughing anymore, and he just starts going, go limp, go limp. And I'm like, please be talking to me right now, and not the bear, because if there's a bear cock climbing up the back of my jeans, about to split center seam, just, oh, marshmallow. So, I fought a bear. Uh, you finally got away, though. I got away. I, I well, the bear sat on my face, <laughs> sat on my face, and I, I passed out. My, my producer Tim Scott pulled me up under a tree, and apparently, my wife at the time, they had she had been doing the mar she had shown up. She had been doing the marshmallow trick too, and they she put a marshmallow in her mouth, and the bear went over to her, and they kind of grabbed the bear. I want to say they put a leash on him, but I know they didn't. But I, I feel like there was a leash on this bear at some point. And then they moved her away, and then my wife came over to check on me. I woke up and I was looking at Tim Scott. Tim Scott is a cherubic dude from Minnesota, like very flat, very dry, flat top haircut, blonde, overweight, sorry Tim, and he was like, uh, I was like, what happened? And just very dry, he goes, uh, I think you got raped and teabagged by a bear. It's like, I get tested if I were you. And then my wife shows up, and she's like, are you okay? And then the joke I always tell is, uh, and I knew at that moment, right then, without a doubt, I'd never do that for her. That's the joke I tell. <laughs> But then I, and then, by the way, and then I went on and I tamed lions that day. I then had to go right to tame lions. The same day. Same day. And then I went and washed an elephant that day. I, d I did a bunch of shit with animals. And they wanted me to get in a cage with a tiger. I will never fuck around with tigers. Tigers are terrifying. Terrifying. Oh, yeah. Absolutely terrifying. I watched one hunt my daughter one time in a zoo. It was just, my daughter turned its back. Second, it turned its back. You watch it just like a cat. Just go, whoof, and just tracked my daughter. And then leapt, there's a cage there, leapt mm -hmm. at her. I mean, it was, tigers are terrifying. Didn't you get mauled by a bull? I got like mauled by a bull. That was, that, was, that was actually before the bear. Be, and that's why we ended up doing the bear, because I had hurt myself. Um, so they, we go to Texas, and they're like, they, we go to Texas. I had so poorly planned for this event. Because then we fly, fly in Texas, and I remember eating Xanax and drinking the whole night before. So the next day, I was like out of it like this, like hungover, but still on a Xanax, like, hmm. and uh, they're like, today you're going to be a bullfighter. And I was like, what? And they're like, come on. And they introduced me to this dude, Scott Medina. And he's like, all right, super easy. You just got to stay away from the head. And I was like, okay. And he's like, yeah, I get it. And this is, like, this is all he taught me. He's like, got to get in this little nook right here. This is where you want to be on the bull. Right here, right here, okay? Bull goes left, you go right. Bull goes right, you go left. That's all you need to know. And I was like, <laughs> awesome. He taught me more about putting paint on my face than he did about fighting bulls. Put the clown makeup on, get in the ring. Get in the ring, and I, I mean, you could probably actually get the real time footage, the legit time much time it took. They pull the pin, six seconds later, I'm facing a bull like this. And I hear Scott go, well, you got a bigger direction, buddy. And I was like, wait, I thought you said, I go left, he goes right. And I just go, I go left, and the bull goes left too. And he catches me under here, breaks my ribs, 
stomps on my foot, breaks my foot. And the only other thing Scott Medina had told me was, do not go to the fence. If you go to the fence, he's going to get up on you on the fence, and that's where he can really hurt you. If he hurts you in the wide open, he'll just hit you and knock you. But if he gets you against the fence, he'll kill you. And I, I, my only words I said was, how do I get out of here? Because the wind was knocked out of me. And I'm, I'm like, I can't use my foot. It's not working. I go to step on it. It doesn't work. And I'm like, how do I get out of here? And I go right to the fence. I go right to the fence. <laughs> I leap over the fence. And you'll see it. You can find the footage. It's online. The bull just, boom, right behind me, misses me by an inch. And then, and then, Tim Scott, shout out to Tim Scott, my producer, comes up and he's like, that was great, get back in there. And I was like, I'm done. And he was like, we've got eight seconds of footage. We can't make a show out of that. And I was like, I'm fucking, I just got mauled by a bull. And he was like, I broken know. ribs. I go, I, can't, I go, what do you want? And he goes, we'll put you in a barrel. And I was like, dude, I go, I can't breathe. Like I'm, and, and, and that was the, that was Hurt Burt, man. That show was just, it was literally, and I, like, I mean, I, I fought three Gracies at once. Like they, they, got, they gave me a knife and they're like, try to stab somebody. And I remember I went after, I think it was Henner, and he just grabbed, grabbed me, hit the knife out of my hand, flipped me, grabbed my gi, tightened it, and just started shaking his head. And I was like, no, 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 I don't want to. And I just went out. I went out so quick. Oh, I, I, he, he choked me out. Dude, you think you can defend yourself. Every man thinks I, I can defend myself. Then you meet a Gracie, and you're like, oh, I can't at all. At, like, all. at all. I couldn't do anything to stop these guys. The, they beat the shit out of me for a solid half of a day. And I couldn't stop. Then they brought a child in, a 13 year old. <laughs> and they said, try to fight him. And I'm like, I'm not gonna hit a kid. And they're like, you can't get him. I took a swing at this kid. This kid beat the shit out of me, 13 years old. And I'm like, all right, man, I'm done talking shit. Okay, at one point, Oliver Stone bought your life rights? Yeah, optioned. I, I, optioned. It, was a, it was a free option. That was after Rolling Stone happened in when I was 25, 25, 25 in my last year of college, Rolling Stone art article came out. So in April 1st, 1997, I'm guessing, Rolling Stone article, Rolling Stone magazine wrote a six and a half page article calling me the number one party in the whole country. It was like, it was a big deal. It was a really, really mm -hmm. big deal. Uh, it changed the direction of my life. From that article, I decided to do stand up. I did my first night of stand up. Um, it gave me the confidence to move to New York because I had this big article. And Oliver Stone had option, his company had optioned the rights to my life. And uh, I met Oliver Stone. How's that? Uh, we were, I was doing the, the, today, the Good Morning America. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a big freight elevator. They were doing the outside segment. And I was going to do the outside segment with like Michael Simon and, and uh, Mark Sanchez. And Oliver Stone was the other guest on the show, I think. And so they, we get in the big freight elevator and they're like, can we hold the elevator for Oliver Stone? And I was like, oh my God. Here's my opportunity. I'm going to say thank you. Because without his optioning the rights to my life, I don't know if I would have had the confidence or my parents wouldn't have believed in me to think this is a real thing. This can be a real career. Mm -hmm. So I got my thing down. Mr. Stone, my name is Burt Kreischer, 1997 Rolling Stone Magazine. We're a six and a half page article about me calling the number one party animal in the country. Your company optioned that article. And that gave me the confidence to get into stand up and do what I'm doing. And right now I'm sitting in an elevator about to do Good Morning America with you. And I wouldn't be if it wasn't for you. That's what I'm going to say, right? So he gets in the elevator and he's just cool as fuck. Oliver Stone just, thank you everybody. And I go, here we go. And as I go to talk, his assistant goes, holy shit, Bert the Conqueror. And I went, huh? She goes, oh my God, Oliver, this guy is hilarious. Oh my God, my family loves watching you. He does all these crazy stunts. He jumped out of a plane with Rachel Ray, right? And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. My whole, all my travel channel reps are with me and they're like, this, and Oliver Stone's like, really? And I was like, yeah. And by the way, now I'm like pivoting going, how do I get my, we're down, we're moving, we're moving. And he was like, well, I got to check it out. And, and and that, that's really great, man. Congratulations. Doors open. And I go, thank you very much. And he just walks out. And I was like, you know what? I didn't screw anything up. We're good. <laughs> but yeah, Oliver Stone's company optioned the rights to that article in my, in my life. Okay. But apparently one of the writers that was working on the script to your life ends up uh, changing some of the names and selling it to National Lampoon. And that becomes National Lampoon's Van Wilder starring Ryan Reynolds. Supposedly. I did nothing with this. Like, just so you know, once that option cleared out, I didn't have anything to do with the movie Van Wilder. I had nothing to do. I didn't write it, didn't star in it, didn't produce it. But yeah, a National Lampoon's comes out, Van Wilder, and uh, I get a phone call from my agents and my managers. Because we'd been in development. They'd all been in these development mm -hmm. meetings. And uh, they were like, yo, we're going to sue them. And I was like, for real? And they're like, yeah. 
we we're gonna sue. I was on I was on Venice by the Starbucks on Venice, uh, over near La Cienega, right? Okay. And I just remember being in my car, being like, "Wow, we're gonna sue him." And then my manager Barry Katz at the time, shout out to Barry Katz, gets on the phone and he goes, "All right, I'm gonna say one thing before we move on into this conversation. There's two types of people in this business, Bert." There's people who work and there's people who sue. Pick which one you want to be. So I didn't. I just we, I just went. You know what, guys? And you got to remember, the movie didn't come out strong in the box offices. Yeah. It's a cult hit now, but it was like it was like you know what? We're good. I remember they're like you know we'll develop your own thing. It'll be your thing. And I think we were in development at CBS at the time, or maybe it was after that. I can't remember really. But um, and so we didn't sue. And then and then cut to. 15, 18 years later, I take a meeting and, uh, and I sit down and I'm like, uh, I don't know who these people are. They want to do a sitcom with me. And they have my book on the table and they're like, uh, hey, uh, we're really big fans. And I was like, oh, thanks. They're like, we'd like to do a sitcom with you. And I was like, I'd love that. That's my goal. And they're like, uh, do you know who we are? And I said, no. And they're like, we produced a movie called Van Wilder. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> you guys. And I was like, and in my head, I remember I met Barry Katz. I called Barry Katz and I said, hey, that was great advice. In this, in this business, a lot of people feel like their intellectual property gets taken all the time. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it doesn't. It just doesn't. And, uh, and you, get, you get in your feelings about it and then you say things you wish you hadn't or you behave in a certain way that you wish you had hadn't in hindsight. And I left the meeting and I called Barry and I was like, hey, man, that was great advice. I thank you for giving me that advice because then now an opportunity is open with people I really respect. And uh, I mean, nothing happened of it, but, but it, was, it was good advice. Okay, so your, your career is developing, you're doing TV stuff, but you're also doing stand up a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, your thing is that you take your shirt off. Yeah. Now, usually when guys take their shirt off, they have a nice six pack and <laughs> they're well built, they've been working at the gym, they may have gotten some lipo. You, on the other hand, just let it all hang out. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, fat guys take their shirts off all the time at home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. I wish I could tell you I knew why it happened or how it happened. I remember, I remember the first time it happened for an extended period of time. So I used to just get on stage, rip my shirt off, kill a beer, come out to um, Black Betty by Ram Jam. It was a way for me to like remind myself that I'm supposed to be having a good time. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of comics, and myself included, you get on the road and you, you're you doing a full weekend and that's your life and no one's coming out and you don't feel yourself making any forward movement. Some people get jaded and their acts get angry and then, then you're not never going anywhere. And for me, it was like, remind yourself that you're here to have a good time, that you want to have a good time and that, and that this is supposed to be fun for them and for you. And so I'd rip my shirt off, I'd kill a beer. I mean, I'd kill a beer. I remember at times I'd kill six beers in a row before the show even started. <laughs> okay. I, remember, I remember doing it, looking at the manager in the back going, one more? Because I'd, I'd come up with a bucket. Could go through the bucket in the show. And then one night in Columbus, I took my shirt off, and something organic happened in the room, and my energy sh- focused there. And then like 15 minutes later, I remember, realized, oh, I haven't put my shirt back on. Like, it's on the mic stand. So I grabbed it, and this woman in the back goes, keep it off. I was like, really? And she goes, keep it off. And they're like, yeah, keep it off. So I kept it off. I get off stage and this comic that I really respected goes, hey man, I couldn't do one joke with my shirt off. You just did an hour with your shirt off. Uh. And I was like, really? Now in my head, I thought this, right? I work on the road with my shirt off. And when I go to do a special, when I put my shirt on, that material that works shirtless is going to destroy with a shirt on. Like in my head, I was like, when I deliver it like a regular comic does, they're going to be like, oh, this guy's amazing. Because I got this... I'm killing with like with with I'm swimming with overalls on with doing shit shirtless and then I go to do the Showtime special and I realize I haven't performed with a shirt on for like nine years and I'm not comfortable in shirts on stage and I'm like literally literally like going I think I'm gonna do my special shirtless Showtime was like I think that's a horrible idea and they're like you are literally giving people a reason to change the channel like you're literally saying oh by the way if you're not into this if you think this is gonna be annoying it's like this the whole time. And uh, they were right. They were really right. No one watched that special on Showtime. Which was... Uh, the Machine. The Machine. However, serendipitously, as marketing works sometimes, best when you're not paying attention to it, I tell the Machine story on that, on that video, on that mm-hmm. special. I post it on Facebook. That December, I post the whole Machine story. 
at like the perfect time to, on December 27th. And at that time, I mean, this is like, you couldn't have come up with this plan. New Year's and Christmas fell on like a Tuesday and a Wednesday or something that way. So people had like a legit two weeks off for the holiday. Like no one worked for two weeks. I posted it right in the middle of that. And I'm shirtless. And so that story goes viral because it's a great story, but I'm shirtless. So all of a sudden I am branded like recognizable in this way that I had not, it was not my intention, but all of a sudden you're like, shit. And then, and then it goes viral. And I remember being at, a, I remember being at a bar at LAX and this girl comes up and goes, beautiful girl goes, Hey, I know you, I know you. And the bartender's like, Hey, and I was like, yeah, you definitely don't know me. She's like, no, I know you. How do I know you? I said, I, I don't know. I'm from Florida. And she goes, no, no, no. How do I know you? I, I didn't recognize you with your shirt on. And the bartender <laughs> lights up. He's like, you fucked her. And I was like, Oh, no, no, I perform shirtless. She goes, hey, you're the machine guy. The, the fucking Russian mafia. The I go, machine yeah. guy. Yeah, so it was, it worked out. Yeah, because on your, on your uh, YouTube channel, that uh, machine skit is at like 33 million or something. something 33 massive. million there. I think it's like 40 million over on Facebook. And yeah. Then, and then what's amazing is once you get a video that goes viral, content creators, those, those guys that are recyclers, mm -hmm. they grab it, post it on their page. I remember one dude got 80 million views of that, of that video. Hmm. And I was like, I wanted to thank him, but he was like a nameless, faceless dude. Like he just didn't have, he just was a guy that grabbed content, posted it. And, and, they, and the thing they posted was uh, block lettering on top and bottom of it was, this is a true story. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> That's what, that was like the blocking on it. Okay. And then uh, 2018, you had uh, Secret Time on Netflix. Secret Time. Was that one. the first Netflix special that you had? First Netflix special. First Netflix special. And uh, yeah, first Netflix special. And I was, I was like super ready for it. How did that feel? Because, I mean, these days, Netflix is like the creme de la creme when it comes to comedy specials. It was that way then, too. Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, it was... It was I, um, I'd seen my friends blow up on Netflix. I'd seen... Tom and Bill, like just, I've seen their careers blossom on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And I'd also seen some of my friends release Netflix specials that got kind of, just kind of went away. Yeah. You, you couldn't tell why one would do well or not. You know, Ali Wong just goes crazy and then someone doesn't. Yeah, you Ali think Wong should. did go crazy. Yeah, yeah and, and so I, you couldn't tell why something would do well and then... Well, there's so much content on Netflix that like... You get this big announcement, you know, on your front page, and then you never see it again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so it's kind of hard to keep, you know, hold on to things because it's so fast. I don't think anyone planned it at the time, but I do think being shirtless on your front on the front page helped. It, it put <laughs> yeah. it because people, you know, so many people saw the machine story that they go, oh, I know that guy. Oh, that's that guy. Let's give him a shot. I saw that one thing that they like that I liked. Mm -hmm. Let's try that. I think you know, it's, and not to by any stretch of the means say that this was ever thought out, but I'm sure the same way. Ali Wong's pregnant belly, people were like, whoa, well, this is different. Yeah. It's different. And so... Yeah, she did two of them like that. She did two of them, right? Right. right. I did two. By the way, don't think I wasn't thinking, I'm definitely going shirtless with the second one. <laughs> I'll get right. pregnant also. <laughs> and the second one was, uh, hey, big boy. Hey, big boy. So, uh, was that the bigger one? Yeah, it was the bigger one. But for, in my opinion, Secret Time was the one that... Uh, Secret Time was such a goddamn good special. Like in my... And I can say that like apart from it, because I, now I have no attachment to that material. Mm -hmm. But I had so much... I had so much chunk in that. I'd really, you know, this is really inside baseball. But I was sitting backstage at the comedy store, and I remember a comedian saying, congrats, I heard you're doing a Netflix special. And I said, I am. And he said, just so you know, they're only going to watch 30 minutes. I went, what? And he goes, literally, they just watched 30 minutes of them. That's why they're doing 30-minute specials now, is no one watches more than 30 minutes. And I went, hmm. really? And he goes, I'm being serious? This was a big comic at the time. He was like, I go out. And I do jokes for my second half, and no one's heard them. They literally turn it off at 30 minutes. Huh. So I thought, well, then I'm going to move my closer up to 23 minutes. So I, I arranged that special differently. I thought jokes per minute should be so heavy in that first 30 minutes that it's undeniable, and you've got to watch the rest of it. Hmm. So I front-loaded it. I, I really paid attention. I studied specials. I looked at it, and I thought, you come out and you tell a joke. That's the first thing that comes out of your mouth is a joke. You don't get lost in saying hello. You tell a joke. And so I was so strict in my head about that, that you go out and tell a joke, and then I hammered up until 23 minutes. I took my closer, but that was going to be at the end. I put it at 23 minutes. And I mean, my, my wife had said to my daughter, 
my daughters had said, hey, Dad, break a leg right before the show. We were in Philadelphia. And my wife goes, um, and Isla goes, break both your legs, Dad. And I go, and my wife goes, that's not, you don't want Dad to break his legs. The reason they say that is you want the people, back in the day, they would stomp when they liked a joke or they liked a show. Ah, okay. You want them to break their legs. Aha. So Isla does the math in her head. She goes, how many people at tonight's show? I was like, uh, 800, 700. She goes, break 1,400 legs tonight, Dad. <laughs> I am telling you, I get chill bumps when I'm telling I had a joke about seven minutes in where it was about, it was about, um, I, I was going to my daughter's school and I grabbed a Diet Coke, what I thought was a Diet Coke, get to school, go to this parent-teacher conference, crack it, take a sip and realize I have a Coors Light. And I remember saying, that's a game time decision, gentlemen. That's like feeling a finger in your ass at an orgy. What kind of guy are you? Do you pull away from it or do you push back into it? I go, I pushed back into it and I killed that Coors Light. And they started stomping on the ground. I get chill bumps thinking about it. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a good spot. Like this is, I mean, they were stomping in the old Trocadero. They were stomping so hard that my wife thought she would, they were going to mess up the audio and I thought the place was going to crumble. Mm. And I walked up, that was it. Now first, you, mind you, the first show I did that night, I bombed. I bombed. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Step on a mic cord, move, mic drops away from your mouth during a punchline. I mean, everything went wrong. That second show was like, like just magic. Like I said, you get seven of those in your career. That was I borrowed one from that night. I took it that night. Well, you made a comment about Kevin Hart, which was kind of interesting. Uh-huh. <laughs> by the way, I by the way, I talk so much stupid shit that I'm like, I've talked so much on podcasts over the last ten years that I do not know what's come out of my mouth. Okay, and so. Go ahead. Okay. Well, you said, well, this whole thing about Kevin Hart, talking about work hard, you'll be successful, <laughs> it's all bullshit. Because you said if Dave Chappelle didn't take off to Africa, Chris Tucker didn't find Jesus, Kevin Hart would be out of work right now. Cat Williams also got caught with a gun in his bag. <laughs> right. There's that. So they, I, I'm, I'm, allegedly. I'm just saying. Look, here's the deal. I think Kevin is a, a fantastic comedian. I, he's amazing. I love Kevin. I love mm-hmm. Kevin. Um, and he makes me laugh hard as shit. But here's what I can't, I have a hard time be, being through this path of, of, of finding a little bit of success. There are so many lucky breaks that need to happen. So many that if you ignore them or if you don't point them out, you're kind of being disingenuous to the people that are maybe you're hearing your message. Like you can work as hard as you want. I know a lot of really hardworking comics that have not had opportunities. Mm-hmm. They just haven't had opportunities. So you can't just say, my hard work is why, the reason I'm here is I'm the hardest working man in the business. That's part of it, definitely. Mm-hmm. But you need certain things to happen. I needed to befriend Tom Segura, who is friends with Joe Rogan, who allowed me on his podcast and gave me a platform and told me, you have to tell the machine story on stage. That needed to happen. I can work as hard as I fucking want. But if these things don't happen in my career, then all that hard work is for naught. If Joe Rogan says, you have to tell it on stage, and says on his podcast, which is now, I mean, by the way, we're going to talk about sliding doors. Joe needs to be kicked out of the comedy store for any of this to happen. Like, these are all the things that I believe need to happen, the sliding doors. And Joe says, he needs to tell the story on stage. You need to chant the machine until he tells it on stage. You need to force him to tell it. And I need to tell that story for four years of it sucking until the one time that I get a chance to do it on a Showtime special. And yes, you also need to work hard, but these things have to happen also. And so part of me feels like, I think it's, it's somewhat irresponsible for people with a ton of success to just say, I'm here because I work hard. You're, yeah, well, there's the luck aspect of it. This is true. Oh, there's so much luck. But, but there's also the, the professionalism aspect of it. Oh, you yeah. Know, oh I've, yeah. I've noticed, I mean, I've, I've probably interviewed a thousand celebrities through the course of my career. And what I've noticed is that the most successful ones are really nice, yeah. are really professional. They show up on time. They're very gracious to other people. I watched Snoop Dogg sign autographs for an hour. I just work with Snoop Dogg. Yeah. He is the most generous. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Dude Do you I've see what I'm met. saying? Yeah. And what I've also noticed is the guys that are sort of on the fringes, lots, and they've been on the fringes for a while, a lot of times are dickheads. Yeah. Oh, I want this taken out. Oh, uh, I don't like how this came out. Uh, how come you're not doing this or whatever? Or, or they'll go and backstab you afterwards. Or they'll do a bunch of sideways shit. And you're like, oh, okay, now I get why you are where you are after 15, 20 years. Oh, there is a... There You've is been a, doing this over and over again. I'm just meeting you now. 
Yeah, no, there's a there's a lot that you, I I always say to people, forget asking anyone for advice. Just pay attention and learn the shit you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Like watch the guy who goes into the club and starts fucking all the waitresses. Don't be that guy. <laughs> yeah, don't watch be the that guy, guy who talks shit about blah, 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 blah. like watch the guy that talks shit behind everyone's back. Don't be that guy. Watch the guy who like and just learn the lessons of the shit you don't want to do is so important. And you got to work hard. Yes, you. There are guys that are like so talented and they don't put any effort into it and you're like if you just worked harder like kevin's a, a hard working dude yeah i can't take away anything from kevin and i wouldn't i just watched his cedric and shack all-star roast the other night by myself crying laughing crying laughing dude jumanji is my favorite movie i've seen in the theaters recently great movie just acknowledge a little bit of, just remind people a lot of good things have to happen oh also. yeah because because yeah. kevin I think it was like his YouTube skits, like that chocolate dropper thing. Dude, on, I think that's what kind of set him off. It, what what happened was, and this, I mean, by the way, I don't I don't want to speak. You need something. You need like, yeah. I don't even think he was the one putting them on YouTube. I think someone was just trying to get views and putting a special mm-hmm. on YouTube as clips. That he, I don't think he did. I'm not certain. But I think someone was doing that. I know that happened with Russell Peters. Yeah. Russell yeah. Peters. Yeah, I interviewed Russell. He told that exact same story about one of his old yeah. skits suddenly made it on YouTube. And now he's a multimillionaire because of it. <laughs> and so like and like so like I say, I always say you need that one thing for yeah. Bill Burr's the Philly rant, right? That one little just little 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 gust of wind from God just going Good luck, man. <laughs> and and you know, for Jim Jeffries, it's getting punched in the head at the comedy store. For Rogan, if for Rogan, it's the Carlos Mencia, him on, on stage. And then all of a sudden, you have a body of work behind it to stand by it, but people can pay attention for a reason now. Now, you were on Rachel Ray's show a lot from like 2011 to 2015. And I guess uh, you and your family would actually vacation with her? I know, not my family, just me. Oh, just, just you? Just me, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just she would me. take you on vacation. She would. She would. Uh, I mean, I, this is like what's absolutely wrong with me is I tell way too much. But like, she. I remember one time she just called me and she was like, "I got to do this thing with this. I got to do this thing, and I don't want to do it. Will you just come out and do it with me?" And I was like, "Yeah." She was cool as shit, man. So I'd fly out and do segments that she didn't want to do technically. And uh, and one time I remember she was like, "Yo," her people were like, "I think her people reached out, but she hit me up." And was like, I mean, we're going to Mexico. We'll figure something out to do there. And I was like, yeah. Because she was fun as shit to hang out with, man. Like, she she talks shit. She's a reg. Like, you know, you think it's yeah. going to be Rachel Ray. Like, EDO or whatever. But she is like, she's like, what are you drinking? I remember, I remember they sent a bottle of wine to us. This is like, you know, if you want to talk about like picturing, like noticing things with celebrities. They sent a bottle of wine to us. And she sipped it. And, she, and this is when you realize, oh, she's also like a. Chef sipped it and goes, hold on, this isn't what we ordered. Sip the wine. This isn't what we ordered. And they're like, what? She looks at the bill. She's a regular person. She goes, there's a lot for a bottle of wine. This is not worth that. This is the wrong wine. And the guy's like, no, it's the right wine. She's like, I'm certain this is not the right wine. And then they take it back, and the chef's like, I am so sorry. You, I can't believe you noticed that. She was like, no, I'm not, I'm not pissing the money. I just want the wine I ordered. That's not it. And I was like, wow. She's awesome, man. She was yeah. she was a fun person to hang out with. She's also hot. I'm smoking. I've always, smoking I've always had a thing for Rachel Ray for Dude, for some reason. The people, the <laughs> the women I have crush on, the women I have crushes on, just it's like it's like the like uh, Rachel Ray, Janine Garofalo, like Janine Garofalo. Where the fuck does that fit into my like? I am, but those are those are my my wife kind of looks like them. I think if you look at it that way, uh, was that. In Mexico, because you had mentioned Mexico just now, when you with the bodyguards, yeah, when you wanted to let the bodyguards fight each other. <laughs> oh shit! I forgot about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we get two bodyguards. So we get to Mexico City. This is like Mexico City, you know, during this bad, all the bad stuff happening, and the first thing they do is get, they give us bodyguards, and they're like, "This guy's gonna live outside your room. He's gonna walk." And by the way, I'm I know bodyguards, right? I know like in my head, I'm like. This is going to be fun. So I tell the guy, I, this is the funny part, is I tell him, hey, we're going to go out party. I speak a little bit of Spanish. We're going to go party, me and you. And he's like, what? And I said, I'm partying. You're coming with me. Let's go. And he's like, okay. So we go out, Mexico City, start bar hopping. And I'm like, do you want, do you want a beer? And he's like, no. And I was like, okay. And so I'm like, Thank you. you you don't want a beer? And he goes, no, 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 no. And I said, do you want a cigar? And he's like, no, no, no. 
Like, you, you want a cigar? And he's like, no, no, no. And so then we get back to my room and I realize at the end of the night, I'm laying in bed and I'm like, oh shit, I wasn't using the right word. I was saying, tu tienes, as in, do you have a beer? As, a, as, in, as opposed to, tu quieres. The whole time I'm going, do you have a beer? And he's like, no. And he's like, do you have a cigar? And he's like, no. And Rachel goes, when did you find out? When, I said, when we got home and I said, you have to go to bed with me. <laughs> as opposed to, you want to go to bed with me? <laughs> And so Rachel and I get start drinking. We got two bodyguards sitting out of the room. Just fucking, just, just lighthearted, goofy Rachel. Just having drinks, talking shit. She's like, let's take our bodyguards to the beach and make them fight. And I was like, oh! And that's when you know you're with someone who's got a sense of humor. Like a sense of humor. Just, let's have a, do you think they can teach us how to pistol whip somebody? Like, just making you giggle. Rachel's fucking great. Well, uh, you talked about how women are the only animals on the planet which will approach bigger animals with absolutely no fear. Yeah. And you said a story about a, a Sereno <laughs> guy telling, <laughs> telling you how to raise your kids. When was this? Was this on a special or something? Not sure. I'm not sure. I went through a lot, a lot of stuff this morning. Yeah, I don't know. My... But basically, it was, it was you and your wife were out with your kids, and, and a, a guy with tattoos all over his face was like, you're raising your kids wrong. You have to hit them. Yeah. And then your wife got in his face. My wife and I was like, what are you doing, jujitsu? Like, what the fuck? When did you learn how to fight? Because like, you're not fighting this guy. I'm fucking fighting this guy. And I'm going to lose. Like, what the fuck? That's happened a lot with my wife. I remember one time we were in line for, uh, for uh, McDonald's, and the guy's not going. And I'm driving. And my wife just reaches over and hits the horn. And I'm like, bitch, what are you doing? I go, I don't want to. I'm cool with waiting for the guy. He's in a pickup truck. Guy comes out, turns around, and goes, we got a problem? And I'm like, yeah, you and her. She's got a problem with you, big time. You want to clear with her? And he just comes up to the hood of my car and he goes, oh, yeah? Well, put your bitch in check. And I was like, that's when you have to be like, all right, get in, get in check, bitch. <laughs> get in check. This guy's going to fuck both of us up. Yeah. You had a whole thing about getting pulled over by a cop. I've been pulled over by cops nonstop. Right, which, but, but, but touching their face. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, so you know, look, this is the beauty of this story is... The, the, the joke is, uh, you know what cops hate when you touch their faces? That is a great opportunity when you get pulled over and the cop comes up to you and is like, do you know why I pulled you over? Just very calmly take your finger, put it in his lips and go, shh, and then take off, right? That's the joke. So the joke is real, and it started, it was on an airplane flying to Scotland. I'm sitting next to Patrice O'Neill, and the flight attendant comes up and says, and I've had too much to drink. I've had too much to drink. I'm wasted. She comes up and I go, hey, can I get another beer? And I can already see in her face that she's gonna say no. And I just took my finger to her lips and went, shh. And she froze. Like, did you just touch my fucking face? Because I knew she was gonna say no. And then she just walked away. And Patrice was like, what the fuck did you just do? And we started talking about that. We're in Scotland, we're sitting at the breakfast table, me and him, and he couldn't get over the fact that I touched her face. And I tried it at night on stage. I said, you know what flight attendants, I said, you know what flight attendants hate when you touch their faces? And Patrice is like, no, man, it's got to be bigger. It's got, like, there's no threat in that. Like, anyone will touch, like, it's crazy that you did it, and we laughed at it because you were drunk, but, like, it's got to be bigger. And I was like, okay. And I was like, what about a cop? And he's like, yeah, because when you do it to another man, you take their power away. And we started, and then Patrice started walking through, like, all that, all that that meant, like, pimp moves, like, Touching a man's face, touch him on the, you touch a man's face, and, and we got really into it. And then that night, I tried it on stage, and it worked so good. Mm. It was like my it was my first joke that worked on television that wasn't dirty. You know what cops hate when you touch their faces? <laughs> you can if you if you want, you can hear young Burt Kreischer ripping off David Tell and pacing. But yeah, yeah, Patrice O'Neill, man, one of the best ever. Rest in peace. One of the best, and but but one of the best. I got nothing. Yeah, I. I I, uh, he was a solid dude, and I absolutely loved him, and he taught me more about stand-up just watching him. I remember we did a show together, and I had like my set list on a written on a piece of paper, and he goes, oh, cool, let me see that. And he grabbed it, and he just ripped it up, and he goes, you're not that comic. He goes, if you don't know it up here, you don't know it. Just go and tell it. Mm. And I went, oh, shit. And he's right. If I look at a set list and I recite it, there's no energy. But yeah. if I'm loose and flowing with it, yeah, we lived in Scotland together for like a month, me, him, Rich Voss. And, uh, and Ben Bailey, I think, came out a little later. And I spent every day, Rich golfed every day, and I just spent every day with Patrice. 
Uh, have you ever done a roast yourself? No, I'm not good at that. No, it's no, not I your get, thing. I take things really personal. <laughs> right, because recently I interviewed Doug Williams. The comedian. Oh, I know who Doug Williams is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. Are we talking about the same thing? Where I because that's one of the fucking greatest roasts I've ever seen in my life. Okay. Yeah. So we interviewed. Well, I interviewed Doug Williams, and we talked about the whole uh, uh, Jamie the, Jamie Fox. Jamie Fox Emmett Smith roast. Emmett Smith roast. Well, it was the Emmett Smith roast, and Jamie Fox was the, yeah. the MC. Yeah. And you know, as he's talking about it, and you know, I played a clip of it. Uh, he said he was seriously hurt after that whole thing. Oh, fuck yes. And and I even said on camera, I said, I kind of felt like Jamie Foxx was sort of an asshole for the way he did it. I'll be honest. Um, I mean, I've been to Jamie's Fox, you know, Jamie Foxx's house a couple of times. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we know each other. Watching that, I really felt like it was an asshole move on Jamie's part. Point blank, period. And I'm sure he's going to get to see this and get mad at me <laughs> or whatever, but it is what it is. It was really kind of an asshole move with someone who clearly was not on the same level as a Jamie, popularity-wise and so forth. Uh, and he just literally didn't get, didn't let you get in a word in edgewise. He kept talking over you over and over and over again. It wasn't just like, oh, let me just throw in a couple, a couple of little jabs and let, let you finish off your, uh, your set. Because you didn't really even get to finish off your set. Nah, I didn't. Uh, you know, I, I like I said in retrospect, I feel like I felt like I was set up, and you know, I think that 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 bothered me the most about it is that, and for a long time I couldn't get past it. You know, thank God for my wife, and just her talking to me because you know people murdered me on the internet. Ah, oh, you got killed. There were a lot of people who felt the way you did, but then you know, you know, a lot of people that just came on and they made comments. I got murdered and killed me, but I, you know, I was there trying to just get something going for myself. Now, do you think that that was an asshole move or do you think, hey, it's comedy? You, you, you know, if you if you could dish it out, you should be able to take it. It's uh it's hard because you're it's 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 meta roast in that he's bombing. Everyone's going to acknowledge that. He was bombing in that. Everyone's yeah. going to acknowledge that. Yeah. But it is it is. It's not. He's no longer make. It's weird because he's. No, they're no longer making up his fun of his teeth, or his feet, or his height, or his hair, or his family. All things that are acceptable. They're making fun of his worth as a comic, and that is where that is where it hurts the most. I mean, then you can say if someone comes up and they're like, "Oh, look at Burke Kreischer. All he does is take his shirt off, kill a beer, and tell the machine story." Get it, right? Yeah. But if you start, if I'm on stage and I'm bombing, and you start making fun of my bombing, bombing's already so bad. And I, I mean, I remember seeing that. I didn't think Jamie Foxx was a dick, but man, I that I remember that. That's funny that I bet a lot of comics know about that one event. Yeah, no, he talked about it, and he said he confronted Jamie afterwards. And you know, I guess afterwards Jamie tried to say like, "Well, I'd heard that he said he was better than me or whatever," and I was drinking, so I just felt like fuck it. Uh, and the guy Doug was, you know, I mean, yeah, Doug was just like, "Well, I don't even talk like that. I, I was the low man on the totem pole. I wouldn't say I'm." Well, that's the other thing is that in that scenario, I look at it and I go, "Doug was not as big as all these other people." No, he was the most unknown person in that room. He was like fresh out. Yeah, he just had a good manager that got him on that thing. And, and that, uh, that also, I mean, we're talking about the energy of comics. That also irks comics. It's like that can be a reason that Jamie looked at it and was like. What's this like, guy doing? Yeah, here? why is he on our roast? I mean, yeah, you got, got all these Monique, and... all these bangers up here. I mean, even at the, by the way, the best part of that roast is Jeff Ross. Yeah, he killed it. He said, <laughs> he, he said, is, I mean, this is like it. It was like I remember why. I remember why. I can tell you where I was when I saw Jeff Ross do that roast. I was in Houston, about to do the last stop. I'm at the uh, the computer center at the bottom of the hotel, waiting for me to get picked up, and I clicked Jeff Ross. Emmett Roast, and it's, I, I, I haven't seen this many black people since Don White and Mike Tyson were handing out turkeys in Harlem, and I'm like, what did he just say? He, he said, uh, you have worse aim than Jason Williams. <laughs> he said, oh, is he here right now? No? Then fuck him. Yeah. Jeff Ross <laughs> killed that roast. Jeff Ross killed, Ross killed it, killed it. But yeah, that, that is, that, that's interesting when you say Doug Williams. I've watched that a bunch. Yeah, I just interviewed him. Good, cool guy. It's an interesting story. You had this interesting, well, you have two daughters. Yeah, right, sure. and you had an interesting story about uh, dropping one of your daughters off at preschool and giving her some advice. Don't be a whore. <laughs> she was about four, four she years four. old. My wife, it was it was just one of those moments where we're 
we're, we take her to preschool, the Sunshine Shack, and she looks lost. I mean, just like, she's like looking for something. My wife's giving her hugs. She's nervous. My wife's like, honey, get down. Get to her level. Get to her level so you're even. Give her some fucking advice. And I just, I don't know, I just thought it was funny. And I just, I looked at her and I was like, don't be a whore. Good luck, kid. <laughs> Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You know, there's a, there's a time when you're a young comic where everything's a bit. Everything's a bit. You look at everything as a bit. And you, and that gets you in trouble. I remember Fred Savage's kid was in that class. And, okay. uh, <laughs> and Fred Savage is like a really great dad, right? Mm -hmm. So he's down there and like, like I was not, I'm not, I mean, I'm a good dad. Like I show up and I don't I pay for everything. I don't hit anybody. But like, I'm not like a, I, sometimes I'm selfish, right? I think about me first. And Fred Savage is down there playing with the kids, playing with kids he doesn't even know. And like, just, hey guys, what is it? Everyone have a good time? Oh, look at this guy. Look at this guy with the Superman cape. You know, and all the moms are like, oh, he's an amazing dad. And they kind of come out and they're like, he's such a good dad. And I'm listening. I'm like, can you believe that? I didn't expect, I mean, like celebrities seeing that good of a dad. And I go, what's really crazy, considering who his dad is. And they're like, what do you mean? I go, you don't know who his dad is? And they're like, no. I go, his dad's Randy the Macho Man Savage. And they're like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah. And I just kind of walked away. And then my wife comes home one day and she's like, hey, were you talking shit about Fred Savage? And I was like, no. She was like, you said like his mom was a wrestler or something or his dad was a wrestler? And I was like, oh yeah, I said that. And they're like, she's like, why would you fucking do that? Like, there's only like 20 parents at this school and you're talking shit about him? And I was like, well, I was joking. They're like, I think he's upset. And I was like, oh, fuck Fred Savage. <laughs> What's Fred Savage going to do? Yeah, what the fuck? Do you never heard your dad was Randy Macho Man Savage and the beautiful Elizabeth? The fuck? That's the first time I someone told that joke? Come on, man. Well, I guess your daughter uh, rolled around in dog poop. Oh, dude, that's the hardest I've ever laughed. That is the hardest. I, and that is my parenting to a T. Is I was, in a, I was in a beach chair having a glass of red wine, and I had just gotten a brand new camera. My daughter is trying to do a dance move called the coffee grinder, is what she's trying to say. But she's saying, coffee leno? Coffee leno? And she rolls in dog shit. And I start laughing. And I go, did you just roll in dog shit? And she's looking at it. She's like, oh, oh. And my daughter's going, no, she didn't. And my other daughter, Georgia, I go, Georgia, smell it and tell me if she rolled in dog shit. She goes, she didn't. I go, smell it and tell me if it's dog shit. She goes down, smells it, pops up, and she goes, it's dog shit. And I... Could not, I was laughing so hard I couldn't get my, my stomach muscles to get me out of the chair to help her. And I don't have a hand because I don't want to lose the footage and I have a glass of red wine. And I just doubled over in this chair and it's just me laughing for a minute straight. Just, it, the, I'm, it is the hardest I've ever, I can tell you the hardest I've ever laughed. One time was when I shaved Tom Segura's tits. That is the fucking hardest I've ever laughed. <laughs> okay. I mean, you're from Florida. Yeah. You're a big gun guy. Uh, not really, but yeah. <laughs> like I have guns. Yeah, I got guns. Yeah, yeah, I got guns. I'm not like a big like when you say Florida gun guy. I think of my buddy Mike, Mike Calta. He's a, a gun gun guy. Like he's got every gun. He's. I wrote a joke about him uh, because I, I don't know if it's in the special, but I said the waiting period for a gun in Los Angeles is like 13 days or 12 days. Mm -hmm. The late waiting period in Florida is and switch. <laughs> like I watched them give him a gun before he paid for it. He hadn't even paid for it, and he had the gun. That's how fucking guarded Florida gun laws are. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you a Trump guy? No. Being I mean, from Florida? I, no, I'm not a Trump guy. But I, like, Florida I, voted for Trump once again. What's that? Florida voted for Trump once again. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a Trump guy. I'm also not a politics guy. So, like, like I, I, I got a Trump flag in Arizona because, like, one of my fans had one. And he brought it up. I was like, fucking, why not get it? My bus driver's black. I'm like, I'll put this in the bus. <laughs> and then I put it up on my mantle... I put it up on my mantle for my daughters were coming home. I'd just gotten back from the road. I take the flag and I put it up on her mantle. This is like right before the election. Maybe right after. And my daughters come home and lose their shit. They're like, Dad, what is this doing in our house? We need to burn it right now. I'm like, hold on, this is comedy gold. I'm going to hold on to this for the next 20 years. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and I forget to take it down. And then I do an Instagram story of like me watching television. And, and the and Trump things in the background. And yeah. there's just a Trump flag on my mantle as if I'm a straight up Trump guy. No, I'm not a Trump guy. I'm not a politics guy. I'm just, I mean. Not your thing. I mean, if I wanted to be in politics, I would have gotten into politics. Like, yeah. that's what, I mean, I literally just got into comedy. I just want everything to be a joke. I mean, a lot of times comedians, they'll do jokes that, you know, in 2020 will be seen as over the line. 
you know, you go back to the old Eddie Murphy, raw, delirious. Are you kidding me? He's using the F word. He's he's making, you know, all types of racist jokes. Uh, I mean, he's doing homophobic jokes. Uh, yeah. He's doing this. He's doing that. These days, uh, you go and make a joke and you got to apologize. Yeah. Do you feel the comedians really have their hands tied these days or not so much? No, I don't think so. I think it's more fun to do comedy now. Mm. It's fun when you take a big step over the line and try something. Uh, it's fun, especially when you crack the egg. Like I have a Confederate statues joke and it took me a, it took me a while to figure this joke out, especially in a pandemic doing it at drive-in movie theaters. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't right. It just wasn't right. It was coming off wrong. It, come off, it came off like, uh, it just wasn't coming off the way I wanted it to. And, uh, and then when you figure it out, and it comes off the way you want it to, it's amazing. And look, I think crowds now, more so than ever, are more forgiving and more understanding. Crowds. I'm not talking about the internet. I'm talking about the people coming to the shows. Get it, and they're, they, want it, they, want, they want what they want. And I think my buddy Ari Shafir said, now now is never more exhilarating time to be a comedian because there are stakes. Like there are you're playing with you're playing with your own money, not the house's money anymore. And so um I mean I I think the thing I think is if I think you can make mistakes as a comedian and go, Yeah, that was I fucked up. Well, speaking of Ari Shafir, yeah. I found out about him when he uh made fun of Kobe's death. Oh yeah. What do you think of that? You think that's over the line or no? Uh, well, you know, it's that's an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting point because I remember Ari, it was so funny. I talked to Ari after that, and he said, "I said a lot of people are upset," and he goes, "It wasn't meant for them," and which is an hmm. argument for stay in your lane, right? You put comedy out on Twitter, everyone's going to get it. His fans loved every time someone died, he would take the most aggressive stance on their death, like the most horrific joke about their death and his fans loved it so when he did that his fans were like oh shit so if you're trying to sell tickets to your people you you maybe you could argue it's an echo chamber but you give them what they want mm -hmm. um i think it was i think that there was a lot of things i, I don't think he knew that his kids were in the plant in the aircraft i don't think he knew that other people were in the aircraft yeah. and also and also and i'll be fair i'll be fair no you wait we're talking about a man who drugged me okay so like he, he, Ari Shafir drugged you? Oh, you haven't heard that story? No. Okay, look, I'm not going to defend Ari ever. I love him to death. My wife hates his guts. My kids fucking hate him. He, he slipped me Molly in my backyard one time. Really? You, how did you not hear this story? Okay. Oh, yeah, this is like, this is before the Kobe tweet. He comes to my house to do a podcast, and he puts Molly in my drink. I'm the way I have a flight that night. We're in my backyard. My kids are in there. My wife's in there. I'm on blood pressure medicine. I got, I'm like overweight. And he slips me Molly, and I'm like, we're doing a podcast. And I'm like, are you on something? Because he's acting weird. And he goes, I don't know, are you on something? And I go, no, I don't think so. And he goes, are you sure? And I was like, I am pretty sure. And he goes, okay, I'm going to be 100% honest right now. You're on Molly. And I was like, what? And he was like, I put it in your drink. And I was like, hold on. I go, did you talk to my cardiologist before this? And he was like, what? <laughs> I said, I'm on blood pressure medicine. And he goes, so? I said, what if this counteracts with my blood pressure medicine? And I have a stroke. And he goes, well, I didn't think about that. I go, Ari, I could die. And he goes, well, the dice is already rolled. I mean, you're on Molly. What are you going to do? <laughs> the dice is already rolled. And he's like, just, just try to enjoy it. I'm like, I don't want to be on Molly. And he goes, well, it's too late for that. Sorry, you needed to learn this. You needed to learn this. I mean, that's so, so part of it, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to, to, to not to defend or whatever, but part of Ari is a little fucked up. I mean, he spiked his best friend's drink with Molly and it could have killed his friend and was just like, well, what a, if he dies, if he dies, he dies. So, so I think you know, his sense of humor is based in I'm the only one that you know as a father. As a father, the loss of anyone's life as a family is absolutely catastrophic for me in, in any respects. So I don't find any humor in that. But if you're a single dude who lives in a flat in Brooklyn, who just doesn't mind throwing Molotov cocktails every now and then, you go out, take the charge. <laughs> You know, and like, and and honestly, I, I got to be dead honest with you. I don't think it really affected him that much. I don't think he, I think he was like, well, I literally, he was like, joke wasn't meant for them. I didn't mean for everyone to hear it. I meant for my fans to hear it. Yeah, I mean, cancel culture is a very interesting thing, where like, 
for a couple of weeks, everyone wants to cancel you. Everyone starts turning against you, whatever yeah. else. And then you keep doing your work, and then it all pretty much just comes back. Yeah, cancel culture is really fascinating. I've had a bunch of friends get canceled. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's... it's, it's um, I remember the first friend I had got canceled. It really fucked me up. It fucked me up because he had kids. And I remember being like, I don't know what I've said. I don't know what I've... I don't know if you could fucking go through my catalog and find... Horrible shit on specials. I said stuff televised that was horrible. Because you just are trying to make a laugh. And my only goal is to make someone laugh. I only want you to laugh. That's it. I don't, I don't want to change your mind about politics. I don't want to change your mind about social issues. I just want you to giggle. I just want you, if you're having a bad day, to get a little bit of release and laugh. That's it. That's my only thing. So always realize that my attempt's coming from there. It's like going, it's like going I broke a dish. But I meant to clean, do the dishes. But I did break a dish. I'm not good with doing dishes. Right. And your wife going, well... Fuck that, you're never allowed in the kitchen anymore. You're like, well, hold on. I was trying to help, right? And so the first dude that I remember getting canceled, I remember kissing my kids goodnight that night and going like, oh, fuck, this could all be taken away? Like the fact that these kids, my irresponsibility, my kids would have to pay for it by mm -hmm. me not making money. I remember having like panic attacks and going. Well, right, because you had a Chris uh, Delia? Chris Delia. Delia, sorry, on your show. And he recently went through that whole cancel thing, I yeah. guess, because of, I mean, and I, and I think what really kind of put a little more salt on his situation was that he was on that show, You, on Netflix, yeah. playing a pedophile, and then he gets accused of pedophile type stuff. Yeah. Not to say that it actually happened, but it's kind of like, people are like, oh, I'm sure the casting director didn't have much trouble with this guy when, when he came into audition for the role and, and, and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if he's recovered from that yet or... I don't know. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't talked to him. I haven't, you know, it's, it, once again, it comes from a weird place of like, of like, I know this is because I'm married to my wife and my wife is someone who will spin things so that I can understand them mm -hmm. is, uh, is I don't know any of the details what happened and what didn't happen. I know that it was, came out on Twitter and there seemed to be a lot of damning evidence, but, but nothing it was, wasn't in the court of law and I don't know what the truth is. All I know is my wife was like, here's the, the only thing you got to know is how would you feel if a 37-year-old man was texting your daughter? And that's, immediately I was just like, all right, that's pretty fucked up. Like, I don't text children at all. <laughs> like, like, that doesn't ever come into my, like, I don't even text, I don't, but I don't hit up people on, on Instagram, you know? Like, I don't reply to people that I don't know on Instagram. Yeah, I mean, he, he got a, a Netflix special that got dropped because of it. Who? Chris. It was a TV show, I think, right? I think so. Yeah. Well, it might yeah. have been a TV show, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, don't know the right way. To, you know, when, when actually when his, I think it was when his came out, or maybe it was like someone else's canceled thing came out, and they were like, these are absolute lies. Like, none of this happened. I remember calling my dad and going, what do you do if someone's lying about you? Like, do you sue the LA Times? Do you sue the reporter? Do you get a private investigator? Do you, like, what do you do? Because the only frame of reference we have is like, is that Harrison Ford movie, um, uh, where he was, where they thought he killed his wife. Yeah. And he just, and he's like, yeah. I didn't do it. And he Fug ran and, fugitive, the fugitive, right? Fugitive, yeah. So you think, I'm, I go fugitive brain, and my dad's like, my dad's a lawyer, he goes, buddy, you don't do any of that shit. You shut your fucking mouth and hope it goes away. He goes, if you sue the paper, trust me, they will just find more shit you've done in your life. If you sue, like, he's like, just shut your mouth and go, and hope it goes away. That's what you have to do. And and so, yeah, I don't, I've, I've been very lucky that I haven't been canceled, and but... You never know. Yeah. No, I mean, I looked it up. Uh, he was dropped by CAA, which is a big deal. Things, yeah. And then uh, there was an episode about a child molester episode that was removed from, like, Comedy Central, Hulu, Amazon Prime. That's, uh, that was uh, Workaholics. Yeah, Workaholics. Exactly. And uh, I remember uh, Dave Chappelle, one of his recent comedy specials, was like, well, I don't think I did anything improper, but I guess time will tell. <laughs> you know, because this stuff comes back. Because Bill Cosby is still locked up. Yeah. So who did you just have on the other day? I was talking about Bill Cosby. Uh, man, we have a lot of people talk about Bill Cosby. Uh, Eddie Griffin. Eddie. Oh yeah, that was an old. Uh, oh, that, was an old that was an old one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You you just um, you know I think it goes back to like when we were talking about Kevin Hart. It goes back mm -hmm. to if you're a good person, then I don't think you have to worry about it too much. Like I'm a I'm a I'm a good person. Not to like put myself out like that, but like I, I care about other people. I'm not, I don't have any, there's not a lot of predator in me. So I care about people. And so like, so like, I'll give you a perfect example. And this is just a little bit. When I, this is who I am. 
is when I was like, hey guys, I'm going to be taking my mask off now. That's how I behave. When, I, when you wipe down the thing, I was like, I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that if you're that person, that bleeds into other parts of your life. And I think that covers everywhere. And you just got to hope at the end of the night that you got to hope that you're a good person. Yeah. Yeah. But also being a celebrity and being rich makes you a target. Yeah. And when you talk as much as we do. Right. I mean, I'm talking on three podcasts a week. Mm. I've been doing podcasts for 10 years. Oh, yeah. And we're talking about doing Rogan when you just would get high and just talk mad shit for five hours. Don't know what you're saying. Just fucking get done and be like, and you just walk away from it. Be like, well, that was one thing. (laughs) Never fucking know what you said. Yeah, I mean, some of Rogan's guests have gotten tagged pretty hard. Um, It happened to another one of my buddies that was on Rogan's podcast. What's the name of the the big uh, Italian dude? Joey Diaz. Joey Diaz. Joey Diaz got lit up on Rogan's. And by the way, by the way, they can cancel you for laughing at a joke. Yeah, there's that too. And, yep. you're, and you're just sitting there in the I've room. Been, I've going. been accused. Yeah, no, I, I remember I, I was accused when I was... Um, okay, so for example, a D. Ray Davis. I had him on my show. Right? Hilarious dude, by the way. Hilarious. And I've known him forever, way before Vlad TV. Yeah. And uh, I remember I brought up the story. I said, listen, uh, I'd heard that at like 12 years old, you had lost your virginity to like two 30-year-olds. And he was like... He's like, yeah, and, uh, I had two 30-year-old horrible, ugly <laughs> women who ended up molesting me. But he was saying it in a really funny type of way, so yeah, I yeah, kind of yeah. laughed. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's like, Vlad is laughing at child yeah. molestation. He should be canceled. I can't believe he's laughing at this. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of laughing at the joke. Not so much the... Oh, there's... I, and it's like, it's, it's not a stand-up. It's an interview. And I'm like, but it's kind of a stand-up. It's, it's, he raised a comic. You're, you're, and you're doing a stand-up yeah. in this interview, so I'm kind of laughing at that. Sometimes when you say the horrible word, I, it will elicit a laughter. It's happened. There are viral videos of it happening. It's yeah. out there. I, if you catch me off guard and you say something I don't expect, and that's the way comedy works, it's, it's a surprise, sometimes I'll laugh. And I cannot... Man, I wish I could... I wish I could... Go in, I wish there was an app on what made me laugh. Because I, I put it on privacy when I went out in public, and then I'd go home and open it up. But right. man, there is not, and shit makes me laugh, that I cannot help it. I'm sorry. That's what it is. Well, yep. You're currently on tour. You have the, the drive-in tour, yep. which I think is dope. Because, you know, I mean, a friend of mine, Dio Hughley, ended up catching COVID from doing comedy shows. I, by the way, that happened right when I started this tour. Aha. We started the tour. We started the tour and we were like, we'll do some clubs to work our way out to drive-ins and then we'll do some clubs on the way back. It also helps pay the bills because the clubs, despite being at limited capacity, the drive-ins, you don't make a lot of money because your production's so high. Yeah. We did like three clubs. We were in Birmingham, Alabama. I think it was Birmingham. Maybe at the Stardome. I forget what that is. And DL got COVID. And we were like, we're out of clubs. And I haven't been in a club since. We did like a couple clubs on that run home because yeah. we already booked for them. But man, we stayed in drive-ins, and drive-ins are, it's an amazing experience. Um, they're as safe as you want to be, because like I'm a little bit of OCD dude. Like I'm a little bit of like, and I also, I don't like conversation, so I'd rather take care of you than ha- offend you. Mm-hmm. So like I wear a mask so that we don't have to get into an, a thing, like when I'm in public. And so with these drive-ins, I wanted to create an opportunity for people like me where they could go see a show and be as comfortable as they were, and then for other people who were a little more like, like out there, they could do whatever they wanted to do. And it was, it was brilliant. People were tailgating and cornholing and grilling up barbecue, bringing out couches, sleeper <laughs> beds in the back of the trucks with blankets, building fire pits. And then there were some people inside their Subarus, doors locked, windows up, listening to it on the radio, laughing just as hard. Very dope, man. Very dope. Well, Bert, appreciate you coming down. Uh, you know, really one of the top guys these days uh, well, in the I comedy think- game. Yeah, you're doing your thing right now. You're doing your thing, man. Congrats. This is a height that few comedians get. Oh, and, well. uh, you know, I've, I've interviewed comedians nonstop since Vlad TV launched. So, so a lot of guys sit down in, in this chair that you're in. And what you've accomplished, um, you know, to this point is, is amazing. I feel like you're just getting started. Thank you very much, man. I'll tell you very candidly, I'm, I'm a huge fan. When I started, when I was lost in my career and I didn't know what I was doing, after getting fired from Travel Channel and having this big Funny or Die thing taken away from me, that there was like a tour that it, they just canceled my dates. Mm-hmm. And I was lost. It was right before the machine story went viral. I started getting involved on like what was happening on YouTube, like mm-hmm. f- finding creators and then getting involved in, in like good content. 
And it was like you, Casey Neistat, um, Mr. Ben Brown, like just random random people, Sean Evans at Over Hot Ones, mm -hmm. uh, Charlemagne the God. Like mm -hmm. I just started finding people that were fascinating me and then just just kind of like immersing myself in them. And so like that period of time changed me from the guy that was a television host into the guy who now wants to be in charge of his career and move things forward and create his own content and do his own shows like The Cabin and make his own thing. And it was, I, it, it, I'm being dead serious when I say it is 100% in part to you, you and that group of people. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you, man. I mean, I love hearing stories that we inspire someone to, to do something. You know, Hell yeah. You You're know. doing your own thing, man. This is next level. Thank you, I man. love this. You know what I love about this? And this is what I drew from it. It's you two. That's it. Right now, there's two people right here. Yep. There isn't someone over there. There's nope. another person over here. There's no teleprompter. Mm -mm. It's you. You're in sweatpants, yep. black socks, black shoes, black shirt. He's got his mask on. He's from Spain. There's <laughs> there's like, the lighting's great. This looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's two dudes. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. And that, for me, was the thing of like, shave it all down, get your team, make your shit, edit it, make it look good, put it out there, and just keep creating. Keep creating. And I'm, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, man. Thank you. And you know, this almost didn't happen because <laughs> me and you were DMing each other about oh this. And you were like, oh, man, I'm, I'm a big fan of Vlad TV. And I'm like, oh, I'm a big fan of you. Let's do it. Cool. I'm like, who should I contact? Oh, contact my manager. <laughs> so I had my oh. assistant contact the manager. It's like, Bert is very busy right now. And he doesn't have time for any interviews. Thank you. <laughs> that, and can I tell you, not to, I mean, not to shit on my manager, Reg, <laughs> but that is the thing that I want to get, like, that that I go, when I run my business, I want it to be like that. Like, you hit me up, let's do it. That's what's beautiful about this. There's no agents, no managers. It's me mm -hmm. and you going, let's do it. And right. then I go, well, let's organize it with the right people. And when they go, and I remember calling Reg, I was like, yo, you, sh you should you turn down, you turned down Vlad. And he was like, what? I go, do you have any idea who the fuck he is? And he was like, no. I go, Google him. All of a sudden he calls back. He's like, holy fuck, man. I've watched his interviews. Oh shit, that's who that is? Oh my God, I'm so sorry, man. He was, I literally just saw it come in. And he was like, and then, and now he's like, he was like, my, like, so this, I've, I'm really glad this worked out. It's all good, man. I snitched on your manager in the process. So. <laughs> Shout out to Red Tigerman. <laughs> Until next time. Awesome, Peace. brother.